the CD. Okay, guys? All right. So I'm going to re-welcome everyone to the Far Corners. We chose Far Corners because we kind of envisioned um, that we'd come from the Far Corners of uh, the earth and assemble here, which we did. We have uh, people from Sweden, Scotland, Alaska, um, Massachusetts, California, Washington, D.C. I know I'm leaving Texas. So you can see we, we did come from the far corners. But the real far corners is to come in from the far corners of our mind and stop hanging out there and try and get centered in our true selves. We just are so distracted in so many directions that we miss the show. We miss the main event that's going on that we were meant to see. This particular retreat is dedicated to Chuck Chamberlain. How many here knew Chuck? One, who, you met him, George? Okay, so um, if, if you're not familiar, Chuck was a, a wonderful spiritual teacher out in California AA. The book in the back is uh, The New Pair of Glasses is from a retreat that Chuck did, and it was transcribed after he passed away. And I got to meet him in 75, and he liked me for some reason, so I kept getting invited out to the Laguna Beach area to talk and hang out, and I got to go to his house and sit in his chair overlooking the Pacific. And he was clearly um, breaking ground for this kind of a weekend, with his weekend that's in a new pair of glasses. And so a lot of the ideas that um, I've had over the years started with him, and then I've just tried to uh, find different ways of talking about those ideas. And the first lecture that we have here is all Chuck. And it's entitled, There's Only One Problem. And if you listen to any talk he ever gave, that's his message. The problem with that is it's too simple. We don't like simple things. Like when we came to AA and they said, okay, just don't drink. Well, what else? Just don't drink. You remember that? Just don't drink. And you go, look, I'm very complicated. I got a divorce. I got that. I got all that. So it can't be just don't drink. That couldn't possibly address all those things that are going on in my head. And they said, no, just don't drink. And God damn, I can't stand people who just go, don't drink. So you can see we don't like a simple answer. The um, human mind likes to complicate it. And here's Chuck. Okay, everybody, in, in, in all of life, there's only one problem. One problem that includes all problems. That's his quote. One problem that includes all problems, and one solution that includes all solutions. So there it is. And what does he say this problem is? He calls it the human ego, but he goes further. He defines it as conscious separation. Conscious separation from what? Conscious separation from God. Conscious separation from each other, and eventually conscious separation from ourselves. We, and in his book, you'll see that he draws a circle of the universe, and uh, it's God is everything, and here's the whole universe, and then just outside of it is me. Just, just barely outside the circle is you and I, existing separately from all the rest. That is what is called conscious separation. 
And the answer to that in our book is pretty simple, conscious contact. And so the, the hard part is that if the problem is conscious separation, I mean, if the answer uh, to the problem is conscious contact, then what is the real problem? The real problem is not being aware that we ex- are consciously separated. We think that we're just like everybody else. We think that we are part of the world. And so this whole weekend is designed to break through this conscious separation that each one of us has. I know when I started studying the big book and it uh, talked about God being everything, you all know that. God is everything or he's nothing. Remember that? It's probably back in the beginning, around the first 40 pages or so. God is everything or he's nothing. He either is or he isn't. What's your choice to be? And there we sat. Wow, God is everything. I remember sitting there going, God is everything. Well, that isn't where I think now, but maybe I'll change my mind and I'll choose for God to be everything. You follow what I'm saying? I don't know if you went through the same exercise. And I finally said, all right, I'm going to think about it in terms of God being everything. So then I just went, okay, God, it's all these people in this room. He's the taper. He's this thing, the fans, the Manatee River, the sky, the planets, the stars, every single thing. There isn't anything that isn't God. And God is everything that there is. And then I took it all in to the best of my ability. And when I got all finished, I went done. Except I seem to exist in addition to everything. There's the whole universe, there's God, there's all of that, but there's also me. I wasn't included in everything. Now, how could that happen? How could I be existing in addition to everything? Well, I know you're not going to like it, but this is how we do it. We make up a story that we exist in addition to everything. And that's called our ego. It is what we have created and live in. And that's why in the meetings we talk about, well, I'm going to tell my story. And we go up there and we share everything that happened to us according to our perspective. And the longer we're in AA, the spiritual part of the program dismantles that story. It simply takes it away. Old ideas availed its nothings. Those are the ideas that we started with. And so Chuck just, I'm going to use some notes that I, when we're little, I don't know about you, but I was told, all right, son, this is your life. Nobody else can live your life for you. It belongs to you, and it belongs to you alone. And your job is to go out and see what you can make out of yourself. See what you can accomplish in this world. And we all went racing off. I got to be a fighter pilot in the Marine Corps. I'm accomplishing. Look at me. I'm, gonna, I'm really getting there. I'm really getting there. Then I was in the nut ward. <laughs> and I'm uh, going... Shit, something's happening to the plan. Something's going wrong. Mayday, mayday. (laughs) Big emergency. What is going on? What is happening? Called hitting bottom. You remember that? Hitting bottom. So all of us that followed that plan, just full speed ahead, crashed and burned. And we thought we failed. God, I didn't do it right. Now, if we asked Chuck about that, he'd say, well, the fault isn't yours. You were given the wrong briefing to start with. The briefing that you should have gotten as a little 
shaver is this. Son, your life isn't yours. It does not belong to you. It belongs to God. You let him see what he can make out of you. There's what should have been passed on to us. In other words, the separation that I experienced was me racing off all on my own to uh, create a life for myself. And from a spiritual point of view, that was an illusion. I had, sat, I had convinced myself that it is just me, that I exist all on my own, separate from all of you guys, separate from God, and it's just me against the universe. And the biggest problem that people have is this loneliness. They, people have been writing about it for hundreds of years, that way down deep, everybody is realizing that they're alone in the universe. And everybody's had that feeling. And we go into a bar, and we're not alone anymore. Only took about three drinks, and now I have conscious contact with everybody in the bar. I'm at peace with the universe, and I'm not existing in that cosmic loneliness. There was no God there. Well, why wasn't there a God? I didn't write him in. I didn't include him. I didn't realize this, but I'm, we're, we're just talking now from Chuck's perspective, not from the, anything traditional. We just never worked that in. We were creating something that we were the center of. One thing you can say about us, we were the center of our own lives. We call it self-centeredness. Yep, there's me, and then there's everything in relation to me. Good, bad, good-looking, like her, hate him, can't stand this. Blah, blah, blah. Well, where's all this judging coming from? Right here, at the center. I'm looking out, and, and you're sitting over there, at, also in the center of the universe. Separate from me. Your center is over there, my center is up here. And we're all viewing everything. And um, things are kind of screwed up. Our perspective that we developed is not correct. We're in the same position that the early astronomers were when they thought the Earth was the center of the solar system. And things just didn't add up. But they kept trying to force it to add up. I almost killed the first person who said, oh, maybe the sun is the center. And I can imagine the human egos back then, and they went, no, it has to be where we live. Obviously. I mean, we don't even have to hardly think about that. It has to be where I live. That would obviously be the obvious center of the solar system. So you can see how this is so part of the human nature, is to start with us as the center. And you can see where it got us. We all had problems with a higher power. We went to church. We tried to learn about things. And we ended up with that same feeling of being alone. So as Chuck goes along, he talks about the absolute vitality of letting go. We use letting go in our program all the time. Let go and let God. Letting go may be one of the hardest and difficult things there is to do, is to let go. Matter of fact, I think the whole program could be summarized as let go. All the steps are designed to slowly pry things away from us that we are not willing to let go of. The first thing we let go of is drinking. But the rest of it doesn't go that easy. Because if we let go of everything, what would we be in charge of? I would have no say-so in any part of my life. That's a pretty big order, isn't it? I would have nothing to say about any aspect of my life. So I better keep some control in some areas, 
or it'll be out of control. Know that feeling? Then, but nobody wants to be out of control. And so whenever I picture the letting go, I picture that great story about the monkeys and how they hunt monkeys and they put a jar out with food in it. The monkey reaches in with his hand full of food. He can't get it out of the neck of the jar. And they just walk up and catch him. Just walk right up, throw a net over him. And he's, you wonder, why wouldn't he let go? Well, I, want to eat, I don't want to let go of the food. I want to let go, I want to be saved, but I don't want to let go of the food. And I think that's the grip that we have on so many things in our life. Matter of fact, we need to inventory it all to find out what we need to let go of. And then we have to go through the pain of letting go. First we try to get the willingness in step six. Willingness to let go. Um, that's the step that separates the men from the boys. So it's an, it's an unwillingness to let go. In other words, all you have to do is let go and everything will be fine. Well, I don't know about you, but that sounds too simple. It sounds too theoretical. I'm going to just let go and everything will be all right? The answer is Yes. So why are we struggling with all this? Because we have not really seen uh, our connection with our higher power. It's a theory. It's a theory until we have this conscious contact, until we have that awakening that is generally described in the uh, ninth step we suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Um, There was something about Chuck that was uh, absolutely contagious. His, um, one of the things that he said, and I want to quote it correctly, at the time that he gave the talk at the uh, retreat, he said, I've spent 20 Nine years of living, expecting guidance. Now, do you see the difference between that and how we traditionally live? I don't know about you. I get out of the bed in the morning and I go, okay, what's the plan? What am I going to do today? Okay, I got to get this. I got to get that. And I'm, listening, I, I'm creating the plan. I'm going out and I'm doing all that. And Chuck is sitting over there just waiting for guidance. Now, you know, that's, um, does that sound like a plan that would really guarantee success in life, set the alarm, get up in the morning, and wait for guidance. (laughs) You all ready for that one? We'll just... Well, I've been running my own business by myself, but from this day forward, I'm just going to get up and wait for guidance. Well, he did that in his business. And his business got greater than it ever was. He transformed his whole perspective on business. He was a businessman that um, designed and installed the equipment in supermarkets and had been fired, very good at it, but he got fired and his boss made him leave and all that and he had this amazing transformation and came back and decided that his only function was to make people happy. And that if a customer came in, he just would do whatever it took to make them happy. And he talks about one incident where the customer came in and said, well, I want the refrigerator down this side. And they went through all the work and everything. And um, later on, he said, no, actually... I wish I had told you that I wanted them down this side. Well, geez, you know, when you've already got the construction just about finished, that's quite a major change. And Chuck said, okay, for the same price, I'll take them down and and redo the whole job and put them over there. And the guy says, but you're going to lose money on it. He said, that's all right. I just want you to be happy. Now, how, how many of us would have thought that answer to uh, somebody we're doing business with. That's all right. I'll just lose money on it. 
I just want you to have the store so when you come in, you're just as thrilled to death. The guy wouldn't let him do it at his own expense. He insisted that Chuck make a profit on it. He didn't ask for the profit. He didn't ask that it, come on, it's not fair, you did this in the middle of it. In other words, he just wanted to make this person happy. Strange way to run a business, isn't it? But it's what, what, what we're trying to get out of all of this is that is the way to live a spiritual life. The message was it really wasn't your life to start with. It was God's life through you. He created us. He has a plan. And we're supposed to just watch it. We're supposed to just allow it to happen. That would seem to indicate that everything is predetermined. You know what I'm talking about? Well, if that's it, God's already got it planned. So you're saying that everything is predetermined? And I said, well, there's total free will and it's predetermined. That's what I would say. So you would say, well, that's impossible. Couldn't possibly be that. Well, this is what I mean. Um, the plan was that I was born in Connecticut. And uh, as I got to be um, six years old and saw pictures of palm trees and beaches, I decided that being born in Connecticut was a shitty plan. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? So the plan was that I'm going to be born in Connecticut, but I decided it was a shitty plan to be born in Connecticut. So I created my own version of the plan. In other words, our ego reacts to the unfolding of our life by editorializing on it. And we're free to editorialize in any way that we want. And it's in that commenting on everything that's happening by thinking about it. Well, I don't know why the hell this is happening. Why should this happen? I don't, God damn, now I've got to wait here for another hour. I can't believe it because it's going on. In other words, life is happening exactly as it should. And I am making up a story about this is unfair. Well, it's about time. That happened. This is good. Okay, all right. So I literally have created a separate world from the one that was unfolding. I just made comments about everything. I'm like a newspaper editorial guy. A great tragedy occurred this morning when my alarm didn't go off. I was late for three appointments, greatly embarrassing me and causing a great deal of whatever. See, here's the story. Just all that happened, the alarm didn't go off. There's, no, there's nothing happened beyond that. So everything that happens beyond that is what you and I made up. And we're going to find out that in our book it talks about all our problems are of our own making. Is everybody familiar with that? It's there at least three times. Well, after all, our problems are of our own making. And as you can see, Chuck is talking about the fact that there's only one problem. And that's being separated from a higher power and not being aware that we're separated. So we come up with lots of other problems other than being separated. I don't ever remember saying my problem is I'm separated. What's going on? Oh, I got the girlfriend left me. Oh, I don't have enough money. Well, it looks like they're laying off a lot of us. Is that your problem? Yeah, they're laying off a lot of us. That's my problem. And Chuck would go, no, it's not. Your problem is you're separated from your higher power. If you were totally connected, it wouldn't matter to you that they're laying off people. Because all of your needs would be met by your higher power. And you would just be going, well, I wonder what he has in store for me. I wonder how he's going to resolve me being laid off. Not how I'm going to resolve being laid off. How is he going to resolve me being laid off. You see the difference? It is, um, 
it's very difficult to reduce all the problems that we have to being separated. So I'll try to come up with a parallel. Back in our drinking days, we're in the bar, and a friend of ours comes in, and he said, you're not going to believe what happened to me. I just got laid off. I just got laid off. I'm, I just, it's killing me. Do you remember what we said? Let me buy you a drink. Is that what we said? Let me buy you a drink. So now we know that buying the guy a drink is the proper answer to being laid off. We can all see that. Well, about a month later, another guy comes in. He said, oh, my girlfriend left me. I'm dying. What do we say? Let me buy you a drink. Let me buy you a drink. Oh, so now we know that buying a drink is the proper solution for being laid off and your girlfriend leaving you. Then he comes in. Well, you, you can already see. It doesn't matter what his problem is. Let me buy you a drink. What, what do we have there? One solution for all problems. So we were already familiar with the concept that one solution fits all problems back in the drinking world. As a matter of fact, I don't ever remember saying to myself, well, here's a problem I won't be drinking over. <laughs> this is, I, uh, I'm staying sober through this one. I'm going to... I'm going to go in the other room and I'm going to figure this all out without a drink. I couldn't figure anything out without a drink. Drinking was the first step in all problem solving. I don't know about you all, but it was for me. Oh, 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 I got this letter. It's from a judge. Jesus, what am I going to do? What do you do when you get a letter? I don't know, but I will shortly. Go out in the kitchen. One, two. Just tear it up. Okay, good. That's that. So, so we totally relied on one power source for everything. And as the alcohol began to wear off, it didn't matter if it was wearing off while we were driving a car. It didn't matter if it was wearing off while we were trying to go to sleep. It didn't matter if it was wearing off while we were at work. We had one problem. We were separated from alcohol. Do you see the parallel? We could describe it in many other ways. I'm going nuts here at work. I don't know what the hell to do. But we knew what would fix it. If I could just get a drink, this whole work problem would straighten out. So I'm trying to draw a parallel between Chuck's basic premise of there's only one problem that we have, and that's conscious separation, to back in the drinking days, there's only one problem we ever had, and that was not having enough booze. That's how our whole life was structured around receiving the power to live the life and to see it correctly and to have a great perspective on things from one source and that was alcohol so we're all we alcoholics are already familiar with this on the flip side how you can become dependent on just one thing so when we come over here and we say we just need to do the same thing The problem is, it was very obvious that alcohol would fix it. But when we get sober, it's not as obvious that God will fix it. Because it doesn't happen that quick. So we have to take somebody else's word. When we're new, we take somebody else who's been in a long time. And he says, yeah, I had that problem, and God resolved it, I prayed, and slowly it changed, and everything came that way. So for this weekend, as various things pop into your mind, try to see 
that that's not the problem. That is not the problem. The problem is I am separated from my creator. Now that that's I work on it constantly. I, I work on it constantly to tell myself I am diagnosing this wrong. I'm diagnosing this wrong. Because as long as I believe what my ego's telling me about the variety of problems that come into my life, I will be solving them in an, almost a non spiritual way. I'll be going, I'm so worried about money. Well, then, it, then the answer or the problem is, as you express it, lack of money. So the answer is, get money. What I have to tell myself is, God, I'm real worried about money. That means I'm too far from God. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Oh, wait a minute. How did that get in there? Well, let's see if you focus on get closer to God, the worry about money goes away. I'll never forget when my sponsor told me that financial insecurity could be taken away with no money arriving. Does that sound preposterous? What's that? Financial insecurity can be removed with no money arriving. In other words, it isn't the money, it's thinking about money. It's worrying about money. What if we could go inside and turn off the ability to worry about money? That would be the same as getting money. You follow what I'm saying? It would be the exact same result. When's the last time you worried about more? I don't know. It's been a year, I guess. Well, you barely have any. I know, but I just don't worry about not having it. Now, to some of us, we'd look at that and go, yes, technically, technically. That's <laughs> technically, what you're saying is correct, but I'd rather have the money. I'd rather have the money. And why, so we come up with that because that guarantees that we stay separate from God. You follow what I'm saying? As soon as we find an alternative solution, then we can leave God out. Um, and that's the nature of the problem we're so- trying to solve as human beings, is to stop looking for alternative solutions other than God. Just back, if you could imagine us trying to teach a new alcoholic, as if you have to teach him about the essential thing of drinking. Yeah, I know you're worried, but did you drink today? No, I forgot. Well, God damn it, come on over here. You see how silly that would be? You wouldn't have to tell him that. He would already be doing it. But it doesn't happen automatically over here. We just don't say to ourselves, oh, this is a God thing. We go, this is a rejection thing. This is a emotional security thing. She doesn't love me anymore. So what do you do about she doesn't love me anymore? You got to get closer to God. Oh, no, I got to find a new girlfriend. (laughs) Every problem that we have, we come up with a solution other than God. Does anybody here, does everybody agree with that? I mean, just, okay. Because I'm using my brain to solve the problem. And very often, um, sponsors will tell people, your problem is faulty thinking. You, 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 just the way you think, it's just so screwed up, it just keeps coming up with terrible answers. Do you understand that? Yeah. Well, what are you going to do about it? I don't know. I have to think about it. <laughs> what? <laughs> I have to think about it. That's your problem. Your problem is you're thinking about it. And so this, the whole premise of the weekend is to see if we can, as problems pop up in our mind, and they they only come from thinking. You just sit there. I I think egos just sit back there and go, I understand you haven't been worried about anything for 11 minutes. Yeah, that's right. Well, we're going to fix that right now. Um, You haven't thought about your retirement in quite a while, have you? 
Yeah, you're right. I haven't. Well, you know you're never going to retire. That's impossible. Inflation the way it's going. You're screwed. <laughs> well, go ahead and relax. I'm sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to bother you. I know you were having a nice retreat. Just thought I'd throw in retirement and let you have some fun with it. And so, what is that? So then we go, oh my God, I'm all worried about my retirement. I'm not close enough to God. Now there's a little chapel over here. It's real close to this classroom. And and if it's not raining, there's wonderful little places. And so we can just take, trust me, if you just said, I'm going to take that retirement worry over to the chapel, sit two minutes and walk back, it'll be gone. And there won't be any extra money in your retirement account. The worry about retiring will go away. That is what Chuck is trying to show us in, in that there's only one problem. Now, his exact words, I want to make sure I just get them all. There's only one problem in this life, one problem that includes all problems and one answer that includes all answers. I'm totally convinced the only roadblock between me and you and God is the human ego. And the best definition you'll ever hear is conscious separation. The feeling of conscious separation. In other words, when you honestly evaluate your perspective on things, you conclude that you're separate. I mean, that's, the, that's what just comes to you. You just go, yeah, I'm on this side of the room, they're on that side of the room. He, he, he's that person and I'm this person. We don't see ourselves as mutually connected to God. The same as leaves are part of a tree. We did one lecture here about leaves and how if we gave leaves an ego, so that they could be aware of how wonderful a tree was, it wouldn't be long before the leaves on the bottom would realize they didn't have as good a view as the leaves on the top of the tree. And they could start thinking about that. How come I got the shitty view? What do you have to do to be up on the top? And besides, bigger leaves do more work with photosynthesis than little leaves. I'm supplying twice as much food for this tree as the leaves on the top and they have the better view. What the hell's going on in this tree? You see what I'm saying? (laughs) And you go, hey, you're just part of the whole tree. No, I'm not. I'm a leaf. I exist as something separate part of the tree. All of a sudden, I'm not even part of the tree. They're a freaking leaf. And then one of them looks down and says, what's that down there? Dead leaves. Oh, you mean we die? Oh, God, that, now I know I die. So you can see what happened by just giving us consciousness. And here we are. Back to what Chuck is saying. So we have a sign behind us. Simply allow everything to be as it is. It's one of the greatest simple sentences that I've run across in the last 10 years to produce a state of peace. It allows me to exist without having any opinions on anything. There's nothing about me that has to be changed. There's nothing about my family that has to be changed. There's nothing about the world that has to be changed. Because this is the new game plan. Just allow everything to be as it is. And now I can already feel it. You go, you know, I like that. I like that. But what about the, isn't that the thought that comes in? Yeah, but what about the... Okay, I'm going to let that go. Okay, good. Yeah, but what about the... Anybody what abouting? <laughs> Aren't there a lot of things that really you ought to get changing? Can't you see how screwed up everything is? How could you just allow it to be as it? That would be irresponsible to just allow everything to be as it is. 
this is our assignment is to allow everything to be as it is. In the program, and Chuck talked about he spent 29 years expecting guidance. Guidance cannot come when we're disturbed. And we're generally disturbed because things aren't the way they're supposed to be. I don't know about you all, but that's the most common form of disturbance. And so by simply allowing everything to be as it is and just stay there, all we're actually doing is just breathing and taking in the room and, wow, and the fans are going. we got wonderful people here. Doesn't get any better than this. Look at all these great people. You just, just take it all in. I'm just going to let them all be. They're all from all over. Isn't this nice? Yeah, but what about... Don't do what about. Okay, so as we stay there, we may come up with something that we never dreamed of. This comes from nowhere. I ought to get my uncle a book. Where the hell did that come from? I haven't thought about my uncle in a long time. That would be fun. He really likes hunting. I'm going to get him a hunting book. Holy cow. When I get out of here, I'm going to go get my uncle a hunting book. I haven't written to him or talked to him in about five years. Oh, boy, when I get home, I'm going to get the book. I'm going to send him this little literature. Where did that come from? It came from allowing everything to be just as it is. So that our higher power can give us guidance. We thought we should be figuring out our retirement when we really would be much happier getting our uncle a book. But we never would have thought of getting our uncle a book because we got to solve the problem of not having enough money for retirement. You see the difference between a self-oriented life full of goals and only having one goal, which is to establish contact with our own creator. What a difference. How do we know it will turn out well without me in charge? How's it going with you in charge? (laughs) Is there any turmoil inside on a regular basis? Oh, shit. I got to go here. Would you like to get rid of that? Yeah, but I still want to be in charge. Okay, well, I don't think we can get rid of that and still have you in charge. How do I know it'll turn out? (laughs) You don't. That's the fun. That's the fun. In other words, when we say, how's it going to turn out, we've already left the now. We've... We've just left where God wants us to be. This is the only place he exists, is in this moment. It's the only time we can have a connection. It's the only time we can get rid of conscious separation. It's right in this moment. We, be, we can be connected to everybody in this room. We can stay connected until we go, wait a minute. I forgot to get the car has to be repaired Tuesday. We're no longer here. And so what Chuck was trying to teach us um, was if we only, no matter what comes up, if we automatically categorize that as being separated from our higher power, we can get peace of mind immediately And just allow it, to whatever's going to happen to us, to happen. We never were in charge of the story. We'll probably talk about this a little later. We we missed the point of everything when we thought we were supposed to be in charge of our lives. It was our responsibility. And as we started out earlier, it was like, I'm sorry, we shouldn't have told you that to start with. It's not your life. 
It's not yours. It's God's life. He is going to tell a great story through you. You're not the author. Do you see the difference? Now, what do I get to do with my own life story? Read it. Oh, wow, here's another chapter. Wonder where this one's going. I seem to be out of gas in the woods. How's he going to get me out of this? Do you see the difference? I wonder how he's going to get me out of this. Well, I better take... No. You see, we always want to jump back in. If I don't take care of me, who will? I remember saying to Chuck, what about the sentence, God takes care of those who take care of themselves? He said, that's wrong. God takes care of those that ask. You see the difference? It is a huge perspective change. And the other lectures this week are designed to to work on this. And they're designed to do it through stories. The chicken and the egg and the wonderful world and stop projecting. As when we get to those, you'll find that they're all designed to solve the problem of conscious separation. To give us some ideas just as the leaves on a tree. You see, it's an entirely new way of looking at things which is why Chuck's book was called A New Pair of Glasses. A new way of looking at things. You had it happen when the first time you went to your sponsor with um, the world falling down. You remember the sky's falling, sky's falling. Can I come over? Okay, come on over. And then you go over there and you remember, well, well, I talked to her. She said she's probably going to leave. And then I go over here. It's absolutely hopeless. I'm probably going to be dead in a week. Oh, shit. And then he said, well, now, wait a minute. You're getting some new friends. There's somebody going to pick you up tomorrow. This is going to happen. We're going to go over there. And then when he got all through, you went, well, if you look at it that way, it's not so bad. If you look at it that way, it's not so bad. So is not every problem we have looking at it wrong. That's it. Well, I'm all bent out of shape. This happened, that happened. No, that's not. That's not. You're looking at it incorrectly. That's why we need each other. In other words, this whole premise is to get us to begin to see that our assessment of things is always wrong. You probably, does that make sense? Your assessment of everything is always wrong. Well, How could I find out if it's right? Ask somebody else. Oh, I don't like to ask other people. I don't like to involve them. (laughs) Well, then you're just going to have yourself to look at everything. You see the problem. We got one narrow perspective. Our whole program is based on getting a new perspective. Sharing with our sponsor. Somewhere in the 12 and 12, people of very high spiritual development always insist on checking with others the guidance they feel they got from God. It is the human ego survival depends on creating problems that separate us from our higher power. That is the whole magic of the illusion of being separated. The, um, I read somewhere that the material world is nothing more than the stage on which the spiritual play unfolds. So our whole journey here is a spiritual journey. Early on, we're told that we are Spiritual entities having a human experience. We're not human beings having a spiritual experience, but spiritual entities having a human experience. So before I got here, I was a spiritual entity not having a human experience. 
And after I leave here, I'll be a spiritual entity who just had a human experience. You see, well, that changes the whole ball game. Yeah. It means this little blip of 70 years is a short story in, in the big picture of things. We had some, um, we had a couple memorial services in the Tampa area recently. And um, one of the thoughts that came to me was that those are wonderful times to remind ourselves of our own immortality, which is just the opposite of what we normally do. Oh, God, when I think about that, it reminds me of my own mortality. No, that's wrong. See, in other words, it's just, oh, let's throw that idea out. It should remind us of our own immortality. Yes, that's what it looks like. You have a human experience, and then you go back to having a, being a spiritual being, not having a human experience, which is what Chuck is trying to share with us. We think we're separate from our higher power. We are creating this story of being separate, and when we die, the story ends. And the whole thing was never real to start with. It was something that we put together. I will close with this because I'll probably not get to it. I recently, uh, the guys from California, the guys from Tampa already know this. Um, I was out in Brentwood. When was I out there? Huh? March. March. I was out there in, in California in March. And... Steve got me to go over to the Brentwood group, and it's a wonderful group, and you talk to these people, and then they ask questions. It's really a cool meeting. And right before the meeting, a lady who was getting her 30-year medallion said her husband wanted to talk to me outside. And I went outside, and this guy said, who I'd never seen in my life, said to me, you were flying an F-3D radar plane in 1962 on a cross-country in a flight of four. And you called the flight leader and told them you had an oxygen emergency and you had to land. And the planes landed. Everybody got drunk that night and came out to the plane the next day and you announced that you weren't going to fly it. And you never flew again. And I said, how the hell did you know that? He said, I was in the plane with you. <laughs> and he was. And he filled me in on the whole thing. We were on a hurricane evacuation out of Cherry Point. We went off and you drink until the hurricane goes by. We're coming back. And instead of a radar guy in the right seat, there was another pilot because we were all going to drink. So he was able to fly the plane back. So he clarified the whole story about what really happened. But the most important part of the story that he clarified was my, what I told myself it was like for the next three months when I no longer was flying and I'm in that exclusive squadron and they're waiting to see what to do with a screw-up like me, a piece of crap who can't even stay in an airplane. I mean, this is a disgrace to this squadron. It's all these senior pilots and no lieutenants, all captains. And I just would come in every day and waiting for my orders to get out of there and retrained and all that. And I just felt awful for the entire three months. And finally I got out of there and I just went, oh, gee, that was awful. And then I went on, drank another year and ended up in the nut ward. And he said to me, did you know how popular you were in that squadron? Do you know how much everybody liked you? My God, the colonel was try turning over every stone to try and keep you flying. Everybody there was on your side. They just were doing anything they could to help you. And I went, wow, that's not even close to my version. <laughs> wow. Holy cow. I guess I'm going to have to go back to that period in time and go erase, 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 and put that version in. 
So what did he give me? Give me a whole new truth. He took my story and shattered it and put in the truth. And so that's what we want to do with the story that we exist separate. The, this consciousness, that was my consciousness about what happened then. They all hated me. They wish I was dead. They wish I was never in the squadron. And they wanted me out of there. That was my consciousness. And he came up and went, <laughs> and I went, wow, that's amazing. And so I went back and changed it. This conscious separation can be destroyed. Remember the idea that we can drink like other people has to be smashed. Smashed. Smash the conscious separation. That's the challenge, is to see through it. And we're beginning it by embracing the idea that that's the only problem we have. And every time all the other come up, go, ah, it's just that problem in disguise. I remember a lady speaker one time got up there and said, our character defects don't go away. They just go off the stage and put a new costume on. <laughs> Hi, I'm your friend. You look a little like lust. No, I'm not. I'm your friend. <laughs> and then they come back in. So what we're trying to to do this weekend is to smash conscious separation by taking every problem that comes up and go, ah, separation from God. Oh, another separation. Another separation. Okay, we're at the end of the time. What time do we go to dinner? Seven. Seven. So we got 15 minutes to hang out, have coffee, and talk a little bit, and get to know one another. Let's all try to just... Yes, sir. We're done. Well, I want to welcome everybody back to our second session. And um, for those of you that came in late, I want to review the fact that we have a library in the back with a collection of spiritual books. Feel free to check them out on the honor system, read them, and maybe you'll find an author that uh, you really connect with. Write it down. And uh, there's so many that have so much to offer as is suggested in our 11th step in the 12 and 12 in the big book, that we seek beyond uh, AA on our own individual spiritual adventure, which is what this is. It's a we program up until that point, and then it becomes individual seeking. And that's what this is for, And that's been the most exciting part of my sobriety is the changes that have happened in the last five years, which are more than the previous 38. So it's really amazing what is available. And um, I don't know, I think most of us, we come in and we just go, we're so excited and it, it just gets better and better and better. And then we reach a level where we're sponsoring people and life is good. And then it just stays good. And good gets to be old after a while. Yeah, it's good, it's good, but it isn't changing like it was. And so then it becomes our responsibility to um, see what may still be missing in our own vision of things. And so that's what this was designed for, is to maybe offer all kinds of different ways of looking at the same thing. And so Amy put up these holograms. That's a perfect example of um, seeing something different after you look at it for a while. We've all experienced that reading the big book. You've been reading it for 25 years. You go back and go, whoa, whoa, look at this. And suddenly you've got a very exciting paragraph that wasn't there before. And that is wonderful. That is exactly uh, what we're talking about. And these holograms, uh, the first, I didn't even know about them until my kids had one in their um, hall in Baltimore. 
and the, kid, the grandchildren were over there, and everybody went out and stood there till they saw it. Only I couldn't see it. So I kept getting up from the table to go to the bathroom, and I'd walk by that damn thing, and I'd look and look, and nothing ever happened. I left the dinner and went home and never saw it. It's the only one. All the grandkids saw it, and they go, Granddad, you got to look deep in. Look deep in. And it wasn't there. So I got to thinking when we were getting ready to put these up, then if you were to write a book on how to see a hologram, what would you say? I would say, just stand there till you see it. That would be the end of the book. <laughs> and a lot of times, that's what meditation is. That's what trying to see through our ego illusion into an awakening is. Just keep seeking until it happens. And then you'll know that it happened. Just as when you're standing in front of that thing and you go, well, what is this supposed to be? What is, what is the hidden picture that's in there? And then when it comes out, you go, well, goddamn, why didn't I see that 10 minutes ago? That's irrelevant. You finally saw it. And then you just stand there and just go, God, this thing's been sitting here all along. And a lot of times, it's just been sitting there all along, waiting for us to get a new pair of glasses, as Chuck said. And then we go, oh, isn't that wonderful? But it isn't going to happen if, we're, if we don't stand in front, and you see what I'm saying, and put ourselves in that environment. And so the first lecture we had was on Chuck's, um, there's only one problem in the universe. And it includes all problems, and that problem is conscious separation from God. And we ended the thing by saying, for the weekend, whatever problem pops into our mind, let's try and solve it by getting closer to God. Dismissing the traditional solution to the specific problem, and instead telling ourselves, I'm just trying to trick myself into believing that there's a different solution than God, which is magic. Okay, this one doesn't need God. Is he buying it? Yes, he's buying it. Good. Well, then let's proceed with the non-God solution to the problem. Yeah, right. That makes sense. And then we get the same crappy result we've been getting for 55 years. Ugh. It's a form of insanity of repeating the same thing, solving the same, solving financial insecurity in the same way we've solved it, solving relationship security the same way we've solved, you know, in other words, just keep trying harder with the same solution. And this is going, forget all that. Just work on the illusion that you are separated from God which you created, it's called, Chuck calls it conscious separation, and our program, what's the jackpot? Conscious contact, which is synonymous with spiritual awakening. So if we looked at the program, I, I, I kid around a little bit, and I go, sometimes it's fun to read the end of the book first to see if you want to read it. A lot of people don't do that, but some weirdos like me will go, well, let me see. That looks interesting. I guess I will read the book. So if we did that with AA and snuck ahead all the way to the end, what's it all about? What's it all about? There it is. Having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry the message and do all this stuff. What message? How to have a spiritual awakening. So now we know the end of the book is a spiritual awakening. And then, of course, the other bookend is why we are even willing to try for a spiritual awakening, which is step one, which says, you should read the fine print about the disease of alcoholism. Okay, I will. Hey, unless you get a spiritual awakening, you're dead. Oh, I think I'll try for a spiritual awakening. In other words, it had nothing to do with interest in a spiritual awakening. You follow what I'm saying? It had to do with, how do I get out of jail? 
So that's the parameters of it. So today, we're going to try a different story, a different analogy about this entire thing that we're talking about this weekend. And we're going to think about the traditional way of approaching life. And it works something like this. Well, I've been looking around. I don't care what you're looking at. The world, your state, your hometown, your neighborhood, your family, your job. You fill in the blanks. You know, I've been looking around my job. Boy, it's, it's got some major problems here. Major, major. Um, do you know how to fix them? Yeah, if we could get rid of those three people over there. <laughs> And, and a new boss over here, and um, move the hell out of downtown, this would be a great job. So you can see how it works. You look there, see what the problem is, and figure out how to rearrange it, and then we'll be happy. So now we look at the world. The world's got a lot of problems. Holy Christ, we got a war, we got poverty, we got this shit, we got that shit. So this is how we live. Mm. We look around with, like, the radar tracks planes. We track problems. Mm, uh oh That shouldn't be that way. Mm, going to go up and move that. So you can see, how is it done? Look out there and then move that shit. Well, that shit is other people. So when we come up there, they go, hey, you get over here and you get it. They go, well, screw you. You're the one. You should move. I was standing over there. You're the problem. Oh, I'm not going to move. Oh, we're just going. So the whole thing involves looking up at the big screen, seeing what's wrong, and going up there and moving it. Everybody relates to that. That's how we operate. And then we tell ourselves, well, if I could get this over there and those two over there and that one dead, this would be pretty nice here. So suppose that somebody came up and said, I have another surprise for you. You're not a human being. You're a slide projector. And that's the big screen up there. And you're looking up there saying, I don't like what I see up there. Well, where's it coming from? In here. It's coming from the slide booth. It's coming from the projection booth. Am I right? You can't go up there and move that stuff. We have to go inside. What did we find in AA? We came in, they said it's an inside job. So the inference is that were I able to go in and start erasing these slides, that would get better. You follow what I'm saying? What's up there would get better. And so how am I going to do that? Well, first of all, we've got to find out take an inventory of the slides that are in there. So let's go into your slide projection booth. What do we got in there? Well, that's a bunch of shit. There's a slide called, that's a bunch of shit. <laughs> and we put that up there all the time. How am I going to put this one? Hey, that's a bunch of shit up there. Well, I'm going to take that one out and I'm going to put this one. That's more like it. You ever have that one? That's more like it. Everybody has their own assortment that you have been accumulating since you were little. We don't have the same assortment. That's why we don't have the same problems. They're similar sometimes, but they're tailor-made. They're stuff that we created. So how do you make a slide? Is there a slide factory or anything? No, slides are made entirely out of thought. All you do is think it up. Yeah, I think I'll make a new slide. <laughs> All those people in the back row are asses. 
put that in there, and then I project it. I look up. There they are. <laughs> Just like I... <laughs> well, I got another one. All the people in this row are after me. Okay, let's see. Holy jeez, they are after me. You see what I'm saying? It, whatever I put in there and then look up, there it is. There it is. So we come into AA and we got to get a sponsor. And we have to invite him into the booth. Or we'd go in there. Oh, that's not that bad. I think I'll keep that one. This isn't too bad. And it would never throw anything away. The object is to dissolve what we created on the slides. Get rid of old ideas. That's all we're doing. We learn nothing new in sobriety. We unlearn, and then what's left is the truth. The, um, we were born with the truth in us, we're, that we're children of God, that it's, this is his universe, and we're just here because he wants us here. It's not very complicated. But that show got boring, so we made up a better one with all kinds of crap and trouble and evil people and, oh, oh man, it's just and mostly unfairness. Everybody has a couple million unfair slides. Yeah, that's unfair? This is unfair. Um, I was reading a book one time where the author was just trying to make us see things differently. And he picked up the egg of um, mallard ducks. And he said, in this egg is a navigation system from the North Pole to South America. Right in here. It's already there. And in this is how to fly in formation. In this is... How to take care of somebody when they go down. In here. It's all in the egg. And then it arrives and it all unfolds. And so our spirituality is already there. It's just waiting to unfold. And it is unfolding. But we're not aware of it. Because we're separated from it. We're separated from the spirituality of our own life. Which, if we were able to see it, you'd be going, oh, this is so wonderful. I just love my story. Isn't this beautiful? So the slide demolition activity is the project that we're involved in. If we went in to get rid of stuff, I don't know about you, but when I go to clean stuff out of my... um, closet top shelves where I stored stuff for years I go you haven't touched that stuff you don't need it it's taken up space it's full of dust let's just there may be one or two things to keep that's worth keeping but everything else ought to go so then you pull it all down and you go I'm going to keep that I'm going to keep that oh yeah that's when I went to yeah that's good oh I'm going to keep that you find one old belt or something. Well, get rid of the belt and then put all this stuff back up there. <laughs> so we need someone else to throw the stuff out, like a sponsor. What do you got there? Well, okay, that goes that. Wait a minute. I've had that. For, I like that. No, it's going. It's going. It's going. It's going. And they force us to go through the process of removing what's on the slides, which we put there. And because we put it there, it blocks what would have been shown through the slide. You follow what I'm saying? So if we took a slide that it's a terrible world that uh, we had put together with all of its details. We got a little of everything. And then when you put it up there, you go, oh, God, look at this world. And if we could take that slide and go through the process of erasing it, 
First of all, we have to be willing to have our own creation destroyed. We're entirely ready to have God erase this slide, which is very hard to do. We start, and then we go, God, it took me forever to make this. This is one of my works of art. This is one of my better problems. (laughs) This has been bothering me for years. That's how good it is. It never fails to disturb me when I put it up. There. Oh, ah! I, don't, I don't even get old from it. I just, ah! I mean, that is a powerful slide I put together there. I just don't know. So it takes a lot of willingness to get rid of it. And then we find out that um, the stuff doesn't come off easy. It sticks. There's actually some pain involved, which we find out in the seventh step. This stuff doesn't want to come off that easy. Ow! Ooh! I'm getting rid of my own ego. And so it takes a lot of humility to actually want to go through the pain of uncreating this particular slide. But what happens... When all of what I put on the slide is gone, the only thing that comes through is pure white light. And we wonder where the light is. And light is always synonymous with our creator. Pure white light is all that's left. That's what was there before we got involved. Okay, light, that's cool. Let me show you this. Shitty world. Now we take that away. So what does the light do? The light shines on everything that we look at. We are now looking at the world the way God sees it. We're now looking at other people the way God sees them. And then everywhere we go, we're bringing light to the people that we're in contact with. And there is a transformation of immense proportions. It is absolutely amazing. And all we've done is to get rid of our own creation. And just going back to how it was before I decided I could improve on it. Anybody can have white light coming through. Watch this. I thought I could improve on God's world. Other people can't, but I certainly can. He did a great job creating this universe. Little help from me, it could be quite a place. I like to create. I like to think. I like to, I like all that. And um, so if I was running the world, if I was the, just give you an example, show you what a great guy I am. If I was in charge, I wouldn't let hyenas eat prey the way they do. I would make them choke the prey, kill it, and then eat it, like a nice, decent lion. But hyenas walk up and start eating a leg while the guy's going, oh, god damn, that really hurts. I mean, what the hell is that? So you can see I really haven't got a damn thing to do, do I? If I'm sitting around being upset, by the way, hyenas eat. But I, you know, you got to keep track of what's fair all the time. And there's... And because if I don't, who will? Who will be keeping track of this stuff? And that's way up there. Just watch those guys. They're just, they come in in packs. They're... No table, nothing. It's just, it's really hard to watch. 
So I guess I'd have to get rid of my hyena slides as well. The problem is there's probably 50,000 slides. That's a lot of work. I don't think I can go through the pain of cleaning that stuff off. Must be like taking barnacles off a boat. It's great for everybody except the boat. That must hurt like hell. You know, just ripping that thing and scrape, scrape, and he's going, Jesus, leave him on. I only go two knots slower than when the... So there's pain involved. But what happens when we stick to it just a little bit, and now there's light coming through? We feel the light. They feel the light and things are starting to look different. That is what Bill writes when he says, we get a glimpse of God's kingdom. Remember that line? We get a glimpse. So now it's like, it's all blocked, but uh uh-oh, this much. You know what I mean? When you, windows clouded over and you just make a little thing, you can see a lot through there. And the fact that we can see it changes our attitude about this lifetime job. That's the the beauty of it. And so in through humility we understand the value of painful ego puncturing, which is out of the twelve and twelve. The value is the new view. So we can see what we're trying to see is already there. The window, we put the steam on it. And then we complain about the lousy view. Look at this. All I see is a freaking raindrop. Boy, this really sucks in here. I made it. I created this thing. It's very hard to admit that you're wrong. One of the hardest things for human beings to do. The first time I admitted I was wrong in A, my sponsor's going, look, you're seeing it wrong, you're seeing it wrong. No, no. And finally I saw, and I said to him, okay, you know something, Bill, you're right. And he said, no, you're wrong. (laughs) I said, oh, it's the same thing. No, it isn't. I want to hear you say that you're wrong. I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I can't hear you. I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It wouldn't even come out. We got steps all over the place about being wrong. We we go through it all in the four, five, six, and seven, and then we get to ten. When you're wrong, promptly admit it. Not when you're wrong, have him drag it out of you over a period of (laughs) three months. Promptly admit it. Well, why would I promptly admit it? Because when I reluctantly admitted it, I saw something wonderful. I was forced into humiliation, and now I'm seeking it. And that's that great moment in the step seven when we saw humility as something to be desired because of the results. It's not a theory. It's not that somebody finally says, let me redefine humility. Let me do this. It's because I saw a glimpse, and I want more. That's what I saw. I saw saw in there. I saw into Wonderland. Now, you get the glimpse, and then we're busy. We got life goes on. I got my kids. I got to take care of that. But I got the glimpse. I got the glimpse. I haven't had it again. I haven't gone back for more. And guess what happens? My ego starts talking to me about the glimpse. Hey, do you think that was real? (laughs) Oh, yeah, it was really real. Do you remember what you ate that night? (laughs) That could have been indigestion. You know what I'm talking about? You could have gone, oh, ow, and then you saw something for a second. 
Are you sure you saw it? You see what's happening? That's a very threatening moment for the ego, us getting a glimpse. Because a glimpse makes somebody want more. And the only way to get more is to make the ego less. We've got to wipe off the window some more. And the only thing covering the window is the ego. So now we're going to take some more. So the purpose of this type of activity is to refocus us on the only task at hand, which is the eradication of our old ideas. There's only one problem (laughs) in the universe, which includes all problems, only in this lecture we'll call it a foggy mirror. Conscious separation. We're separated from seeing the kingdom because of the fog. And we were all in a fog for a lot of years. The point being, it's there. It's, it's absolutely real. We have created a blockage to it so that we can claim it's not real. Well, I never saw anything. I never saw God. You, what, you, th- you say God is everywhere? I never saw him. Why not? I covered the window so I couldn't see. So if, I could take a lie detector and say I never saw God, and it wouldn't move because I never did. But I didn't realize I was responsible for not seeing him, that I was playing the most horrible joke on myself, which was to create the idea that it's just me and that I'm in charge of my life and I have to accomplish everything and it's just me against the world. And that's not the way it was set up. That's the way I put it together. Terrible thought, isn't it? Why would someone do that to oneself? Well, I have no idea. Um, I think it's because that's what we were taught. I think it's because there's a collective unconsciousness on the whole planet. And so there's something about everybody seeing it wrong that makes you think you're seeing it right. You know what I mean? Well, everybody says there's no God and you just need to get a jaguar. That's the only damn problem. And so we're bombarded with material answers to our spiritual problems all the time. Move to Canada, move to Alaska, move to Florida, move here. Then all of those problems that you have will be gone. The problem is, I'm a slide projector. These are the slides that I have, and no matter where I go, when I turn on, put the screen up and hit the switch, I'm going to see the same mess that I put together inside of me. So you can see how the steps of the program are being looked at in a different way. Instead of inventorying our character defects, we're inventorying a slide projector booth. But maybe it causes us to see it differently. It helped me see that All this wonderful stuff is just there waiting for me to see it. And sometimes someone else can help us see it differently. Which a new pair of glasses, just the title, transformed the way I thought about things. So all problems are that I'm seeing them wrong. I used to do a little routine where... Okay, when you arrive in AA, you have life sucks glasses. Oh, oh boy, everything sucks. And then when you do all the steps, they hand you the life is wonderful glasses. And so you put them on, you go, oh, oh, this is wonderful, wonderful. See, that, if that was all there was, this would be the simplest program in the world. But here's where the rub comes in. On the way back, when you come up to get the glasses like you get a medallion, The person handing you says, by the way, we recommend you throw away the old glasses. 
you know, the life sucks glasses, just throw them away. Well, that's like that slide that, yeah, you've got to get rid of these. But I've had them so long, I'll just put them in the drawer. And guess who tries them on again just to see what it's like? Yeah, I remember I used to look through these glasses. Bingo! We're back in that world again. Why would we go back there? It's my world. I built it. I'm in charge of this world. I'm the center of this world. I know, but you feel like committing suicide. Yes, but I'll commit suicide in my own little world. (laughs) This is why pride leads to character defects. The others, we could add them all together, and they might constitute 1% of pride. <laughs> it's my world, it's my life, it's my way of thinking, and I put it together, and I just don't think I should have to get rid of all of it. And so then we run to the whole comedy routine and the uh, sixth step. Well, how much would you like to get rid of? Well, what are we talking about? Well, you have, um, as I've done the inventory here, I see about 157 lust slides. You really like those slides, don't you? Well, I don't look at them that much. Well, you did, but they're, 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 there's a lot of them, but I don't look at them much. Okay. Well, how many would you like to get rid of? We recommend you just dump them all. Yeah, no, I hear you, and I think you, I think you make a very, very, very valid point. But why don't we start with 70? <laughs> why not all of them? I don't know. No lust, huh? That's right. I don't know, it sounds like you have to be dead. Uh, for that to happen. I'd like to get rid of most of them. I would say most, if you could get rid of most of those slides, that would make me happy. All right, well, what about greed? Every ounce of greed inside of you would be removed. It would never even come up. You'd never even think about getting something else or anything like that. You would be free from wanting. That's the spiritual jackpot. Free from wanting. Why don't we just suck it dry? No greed left. Um, Well, how would I get any shit? How how would I... (laughs) How would that... What would that process look like? (laughs) I think you ought to take... Two-thirds. Two-thirds be good on greed. I'd, I'd like to get rid of greed. And then you, you guys have heard me go through all the ones. And I think my favorite are the um, 621 gossip slides. <laughs> oh, man, boy, I know this and I know that and all that. And then you go, you know, it really, it's, it's um, the most damaging thing. Dr. Bob said that's one's going to destroy AA. It's a terrible thing. Ruins people's character, ruins things. They're not even present. They're being destroyed. It is a vicious, terrible, disgusting, rotten thing. And you ought to be in, want to get rid of every one of those slides. You make a good point, and I do want to get rid of them. I agree. It's absolutely disgusting, and it's out the window. However, on the occasion when I didn't originate the gossip... <laughs> And I am merely serving the role of a telephone pole as it comes through, the wires come through me on the way to the next person. So I'd like to get rid of the originating gossip, and you know the whole, the whole routine. So we settle for a minimum amount of light shining through. As Bill says, just enough to get us by. It's out of the seventh step in the 12 and 12. We settle for as much perfection as will get us by. What would be perfection? Pure light. That's it. We would simply take 
the slide remover and apply it to every slide so that everything we created is now gone. And the only thing that would be left is what God created, which he created for us to enjoy. That's all we're supposed to do with it. We're not supposed to evaluate it. We're not supposed to say mountains should be higher, glaciers should be smaller, rivers should be this way. We're supposed to just enjoy it. And so that's our little story about the slide projector. It helps us see the magnificence of what's possible. You see why letting go is synonymous with cleansing the slides. Let go of everything I created. Let go of every opinion, every judgment, everything. It would be like, I don't exist. That's right. God is everything. I'm nothing. I am simply the instrument for the light to shine through. And everywhere I go, I bring light. Isn't that nice? Like the prayer of St. Francis when you get near the end? Where those shadows, I bring light. How can I bring light? You are light. It's there. That's what you are, is light. You made this thing to block it. And then you go, there is no light. And we could go right down the whole prayer of St. Francis. And we are all the things that he's telling us to bring. Where there's sadness, I bring joy. Where am I going to get joy? You are joy. You've blocked yourself from letting it come out. So it's all there. There's nothing new that has to be acquired. It's all there. It just has to be unblocked. That's that's it. It has to be unblocked, erased, let go of. Whatever story we want to use, isn't that magnificent good news? Isn't that simple? It's absolute simplicity. There's a book back there, Brother Lawrence, Practicing the Presence. This man, he was around about three or 400 years ago. He has gotten simplicity down to, I want to give you a sentence out of there. He's got simplicity down. It's just beautiful. It's like every sentence he writes, you go, well, I guess that's about as, You can't reduce it any more than that. He likes to practice. Chuck talked about this. Walking along holding God's hand. He talks about that all the time. You remember that? 29 years of expecting to receive guidance. 29 years of just walking along. What do you do? I'm just hanging out. Just hanging out with God. Well, aren't you busy? Don't you have a lot? No, I'm just hanging out. Sounds irresponsible, doesn't it? (laughs) And that's what our ego will tell us. You can't be doing it. You've got a lot of shit you've got to do. That has to be straightened out. That has to be straightened out. Because you see, as we get successful and we suddenly realize this is where it all is, all we ever have to do is keep cleaning the booth out. Just get it out. Cut more of that inventory. Chuck called it uncover, discover, pew, discard. Oh, one more slide. I forgot this one. Pew. And the more they get thrown away, the more light comes out. But our ego will keep doing, it'll do stuff like this. We'll be sitting there, yeah, God, life is wonderful. It'll come in and go, hey, look up there. And the next thing we're looking at the screen. Oh, my God. <laughs> Trouble in Crystal City. <laughs> and, uh, and we get trapped back into looking out there to decide what needs to be done. And there's nothing that needs to be done out there. So he came up with uncovered, discovered, discard. The um, Oh, I, th- I just want to get to the end where the promises come in step nine. And you can see the promises happening in the slide booth. You know what I mean? Okay, I got 15 slides about fear of people and of economic insecurity. <coughs> wow, they left me. 
Remember that in the promises? Fear of people and of economic insecurity left me. Isn't that amazing? Self-seeking slipped away. Where the hell did it go? Well, we just got it here. We put it back in the projector. Self-seeking. All I see is light. Where is it? You see, the, pro- the, the promises are describing the absence of self. This is gone. That's gone. Then we suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. We saw the light. Oh, my God, look at that. And we know we're not creating that light. We're allowing the light to come out. We are not blocking it anymore. We're not the light. We are allowing it to come out. So it's been there all along. That's the fun part of this whole thing. It's been there since we were born. And now's the chance to come on home. Chuck called us all prodigal sons. Okay, you created your world. You had your fling out there. You created, you painted all these signs. <laughs> you, you, got the, you got a stockpile in there. You got opinions on everything. <laughs> Why don't we get rid of them all and give me your hand and come on home. And that's all we're doing is coming home. We can come home while we're still alive. That's what the last line in the prayer of St. Francis means. It is by dying that one awakens to life eternal. It doesn't mean you're dead. It means there's no slides left. Your heart's beating. You're still strong. You're walking along. The only thing coming out is the light. You're dead. You follow what I'm saying? The old you. This... Um, Frankenstein monster of old ideas that we slapped together at age 3, 5, 10, 15, 20, borrowed some from bathroom walls, got a couple more from an irate uncle, got a couple more from somewhere else, got some of them in the war, got some of them here, and they're all... That was ours. That's what is going to die, is that mess. And then what's left is just the way God created you, me, and everybody else. And there comes a time when you look in the mirror and you see the most wonderful person. You see the light coming through. And you realize this is the way it's been all along. I just wasn't able to see it. Okay, we're at the end of the time. Let's uh, hang out, visit, and uh, have some more coffee. And everybody get to know each other. One announcement. Thank you, guys. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm looking forward to our third session here. And I want to start out by uh, explaining something. I'm learning something about myself all the time. I was really uncomfortable uh, yesterday afternoon, and I couldn't figure out why. It's not like me. And, I, and now I know why. I um, did a series of step talks recently in Tampa, and I decided to incorporate in them um, history one week, the 40s, then the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And there's so many uh, obscure events that happened then that I couldn't remember them. So I started making notes. And then I would look at the notes in order to get all the stuff. And I somehow told myself that my memory was shot and that from now on, you better give talks with, <laughs> with notes, which Jack noticed. He said, how long have you been using notes? And, of course, I'm talking and I'm going, I wonder if I'm following the notes right. And it was driving me crazy. And um, so at 3 this morning, this is, <laughs> this is more typical because this is going to be fun. I came up with the lecture for now. <laughs> and uh, so there won't be a chicken and egg lecture. Uh, we're going to have an entirely different one. 
and that's why I'm so excited. Uh, just for the CD purposes, the uh, chicken and the egg was uh, sort of a way of, um, like the holograms, of coming up with a different way of looking at things. And it, it, it started with, you know what a chicken is? A chicken is nothing more than an egg's way of reproducing itself. And you go, well, God damn, I never would have looked at it that way. And uh, very interesting, but hardly the basis for a lecture. What came to mind in very strong clarity was some lines out of the 12 and 12, step 11. And I think if I took a show of hands in here as to what is the step that is used the least in AA, we would all raise our hands to step 11 compared to the 12 step work that we do and we're working new guys through the steps and we're doing this and we're doing that. And step 11, and Bill writes about that, that it has a hard time making itself part of our everyday life. So there were some sentences um, just to set the stage. And the first sentence I'm reading, read this sentence or think about this sentence in terms of your own ego, as we've been talking about the ego as blocking us. And the sentence read... We, we well remember how something deep inside us kept rebelling against the idea of bowing before any god. Well, I wonder what part of that was, of us that was. <laughs> Don't you be bowing down. Don't you be bowing down. And it was the part in me that doesn't want something to take its place. I want to bow down to my own ego. And now we have everything in proper perspective. So when um, I arrive in this program and they go, well, there's this wonderful God. You just go turn everything over to him. There's part of us that are going, I don't think so. I don't think that's going to be a plan that we're going to follow. Then on the next page is where he said, now and then we may be granted a glimpse of that ultimate reality, which is God's kingdom. And I think we talked about that yesterday. Somewhere along the way, it's like you just get the shade to open about that far, and you just go, yow. Well, back to the real world. You, you know what I mean? Well, that's cool. But life is waiting. Life is waiting. I think there was a line in the uh, chicken and egg lecture of a, a little... Um, one-line poem called The Dumb, Stupid World. And this is the Dumb, Stupid World poem or line. A man sat in his backyard for several days having a most intimate and wonderful conversation with his own God while the world passed him by. Dumb, Stupid World. And it's just a way of, yeah, that's interesting, but there's stuff that has to be done here. And we would look at that and go, now, what a waste of time that is when there's money to be made. So the glimpse. Then the world's libraries and places of worship are treasure trove for all seekers. So now you see where... The idea that seeking as an individual springboards out of our own literature. We get to this point, now it's up to you, not your sponsor, you. He can't pick a book out and read it and connect and see where it takes you. He helps you get there, and now you're... And I think the reason you're here is something inside of you said, I wonder if I can go further than I am right now. And the answer is yes. It's, I don't know, who, who knows how far? So let's look at the next and last page that I want to... Um, uh, After all, no man, Bill's talking about um, using our imagination 
and how we used to fantasize about stuff, and then so we criticize it. But he's talking about imagination. There's nothing wrong with constructive imagination. All sound achievement rests upon it. After all, no man can build a house until he first envisions a plan for it. Well, meditation is like that, too. It helps to envision our spiritual objective before we try to move towards it. I can't tell you how many years my spiritual objective was just keep going to meetings, pray, uh, help other people, do some service work, really try to be a good AA. Now, that's a very noble spiritual objective. And many of us have settled into that with a degree of excitement and comfort that has kept us going for a long time. But from time to time, I don't know about you, but I would look at someone like the Dalai Lama, and I would go, what is that? And then, with the audacity, I would say, I wonder if I could do that. And then came the backlash. You wouldn't believe it. Are you kidding? You're just a little puke. (laughs) Don't you even think about that. Don't you get that off your radar. I bet you would have the same reaction if you took that inside and said, you know, I might try to be like these spiritual writers. Be like Stephen Levine, be like Adyashante, be like Joel Goldsmith, be like the people we have that have written those books who are talking about a view of life that is so exciting. It's like reading science fiction. They are in, oh, is that, what a place that is. Well, that's fun to read about it. What about going there? How could you go there until you made that your spiritual goal, your spiritual objective? And so about four or five years ago, I just said to myself, I'm going to fully awaken. I don't know if I am, but that's opened up. I can't tell you what happened after that. It's just like, wow. Wow. And things just keep coming in that are really exciting. So what I'm suggesting is watch your own reaction as you take it in. You know something? I think I'm going to fully awaken. And watch out for the beating you're about to take. (laughs) From, From yourself as that idea comes in to the kingdom that is currently in place. Because that would be an overthrow, a complete overthrow of the monarchy that has been existing inside of you for all your life. So we clearly don't want to get rid of all our old ideas. We don't want to. And then we wonder, and, 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 and sometimes I, I think about... Um, Remove remove all the character defects that stand in the way of my usefulness. The reason I still have them is God has determined that they're not blocking my usefulness. So the reason I'm still kind of an ass, God wants me to stay an ass, which is a complete mistranslation of that whole thing. In other words... As preposterous as it may sound, the reason we're not fully awakened, just like these people that we see, just like St. Francis, is that we don't want to be. We've, we've told ourselves, no, you can't have that. You don't deserve that. Don't put that on your agenda. Put, get a little better than I am. That would be good for you. 
That's about all you deserve, a little better than you are. We'll give you that much more territory out of the kingdom because we already gave up the whole drinking area over on the East Coast. (laughs) But the rest of it has to stay under our control in here. Okay, so when you think about awakening, that's our whole program. We talked about that. The purpose of the 12 steps is to have a spiritual awakening. So awakening is the solution to the problem that human beings have. If that's the solution, then what's the problem? Now, this is, this, here it gets a little tricky. What is the problem if the answer to the problem is having an awakening? The problem is not knowing that we're not awake. You you understand? That's so to the person, there is no problem. He can't possibly sit there going, gee, I'm not awake. We think we're awake. That's why it's so difficult. So to, to get the point home, if we use awaking, what do we wake from in, in real life every day? Sleep. We go to sleep and then we wake up. And then sometimes when we sleep, we have a dream. Well, the dream was real. That dream was, I couldn't believe it. They were chasing me, they were chasing me, and then I woke up. So when you woke up, then you're no longer being chased by a gorilla. But while you're being chased by a gorilla, you don't say to yourself, I'm just dreaming. You're running like hell because it's real. And it's real because I'm thinking it. That's how everything gets real is I think it. So here's the scenario to make the point of how difficult this is. We make a movie out of it. Guy, guy falls asleep and he goes into a dream and he can't get out of it. And he's been dreaming now for, you know, like five years and all his friends, come on, wake up. And whatever they do, he's just there. And then you can see him, you know, he's obviously having reactions to this. So we got to rescue him. And you're his closest friend. And the scientists have figured out a way to reduce you down to a drop so they can inject you inside of his brain. This is a good science fiction movie. We could get this into Hollywood. So getting aside the difficulties of getting there, you're there. And your friend says, Ralph, what are you doing here? Oh, I just came to talk. I want to talk to you. Oh, good, man. I'm glad you're here. Oh, yeah. Now, your job is to convince him that he's dreaming, that everything that's happening is a dream. What are you going to tell him? Hey, you're not awake. (laughs) Yes, I am. I'm right here talking to you. What do you mean I'm not awake? No, you're in a dream. You're dreaming. Come on, listen to me. I'm going to explain. I think we would fail. That's what I think. I think it would be extremely difficult to go have him say, Oh, I see. You're right. I am dreaming. None of this is real. So now we're here, and we're trying to do that to ourselves. I see none of this is real. What's real is that glimpse that I had. And and what's so exciting about the glimpse is we're willing to settle for that. You know, I went through life. I I was sober. I helped a lot of people, and I had a glimpse. And that was pretty darn good. It was, it really added some meaning to my life. And so, as the seventh step says, we tend to settle for as much perfection as will get us by. I think that's, I think somebody who had that really ought to be satisfied with it. Not many people get that glimpse. I really ought to settle for just a glimpse. This is... The rest of it, 
I don't know what we say about the rest of it, but it's an explanation for settling for good. This is good. And Bill has written, I think he was quoting Lincoln, but he has said that the good is the worst enemy of the best that there is. It'll keep us at the good level, and we never will try. The heat never gets high enough to want to change. We stay in a comfort level that is acceptable. And I like it. Doing good, man. Things are great. I'm very comfortable in my own skin. And that'll, that can just stay there. But we never will forget the glimpse. And every so often we'll go back to it and almost like yearning. What is the glimpse? It's, it's returning home. Chuck talks about it all the time. We're going home. We got our father's hand and we're walking back home. We've been out on a prodigal son adventure. And it didn't work out. It didn't work out. We tried to the best of our ability to create the type of life that we wanted, and we all failed. The beautiful gift that we have as alcoholics, we fail so dramatically that something has to be done about it. We're in the nut ward, in a straight jacket, convulsing, and people won't even come talk to us. Whereas the vast majority of the population fails at an acceptable level. <laughs> and simply suffers from midlife crisis. What's this all about? I got the yacht, I'm sitting out here thinking of suicide. You see what I'm saying? But it never got really rotten. It's only when it got rotten that we became willing to crack our own ego a little bit in order to survive. And even the ego had to go along with that because it knew that if we actually did commit suicide, it goes too. (laughs) And so (laughs) there is a reasonable amount of cooperation on the fatal things that we have but on the non-fatal ones which are all the other deadly sins it settles for as much begrudging progress that it has to concede to keep us from going too far too far would be fully awakened and so I don't know about you but it it is so hard to imagine you in the same spiritual energy as these figures that we're talking about. What do you think is different between you or anyone else in this room and um, Alan Watts or St. Francis? They had a better beginning? Read the life of St. Francis. Holy cow, he made us look like amateurs. He's on crusades, whacking people's heads off, just going off and off, and then he finally leaves the the strictures of the church and goes on a personal search to achieve a different level with with a obsession about killing his own ego. So he's just a regular guy, all screwed up and came to a turning point, and then kept going with it. That's the difference. Everybody, all the um, stories of the great stories that we've read all start out looking like they're failures. You know, every success story, every Hollywood movie, it always starts out with the failure and then the rebound And that's what makes it magnificent. 
So, all of enlightened, awakened, whatever you want to call it, people start out average, start out failing, start out just like you and I. The reason is we're all the same. We're all created by the same creator. We we're all have full spiritual connection with our own creator. It's all there equally. It's not, no one is less equal. We all have exactly the same <clears throat> as we open up. The same energy is inside of me as inside of anyone else. So what's the problem? Well, just what we've been talking about. The human ego. What did we start with Chuck's lecture? There's only one problem that includes all problems. It's separation from God. It's a, our conscious awareness tells us that we exist as a separate entity from everybody else in this room, from everybody else on the planet, and from God, and sometimes from ourselves. It's almost like we're divided inside. Probably the hardest peace to achieve anywhere would be peace with yourself. Imagine this. You get in a race with God. You ready? Here's the race. See if you can forgive yourself before he does. Uh Uh-oh, sorry, you lose. (laughs) Not even close. How long does it take you to forgive yourself when you really screw up? Everybody else said it's fine. So you're two hours late. It's fine. Fine. We're happy with We're so happy you're here. We don't care. Is that what you do? Yeah, it is fine. You're still going at night in bed. God, I can't believe I did that. <laughs> the hell did I do that for? Boy, you really look stupid with all those people. I don't know about you, but I just go on and on. Then if, if I'm bored, I'll, I'll remember something from a year ago. Remember when you got lost a year ago? Let's go over that again. <laughs> That really was, that really was a screw up. That was probably the biggest screw up any guy ever did anywhere. So it's just sitting around. These are like weapons in the torture room. Well, that's this. What do we got tonight? So there is an inner conflict inside of everyone in this room, inside of me. And we haven't been able to resolve it. So what do we, I don't care, we pick any problem. I'm picking inner conflict. Can't get at peace with ourselves. Now we already know there's only one problem. (laughs) That includes all problems. Okay, got an inner conflict. What am I going to do? I'm going to go to a shrink. I'm going to talk about my childhood. And I'm going to find out what's causing this inner conflict. And then maybe I can... Put it to rest, and maybe I can figure it out. Maybe I can learn what this inner conflict is, and then maybe I can put it to rest. And, the, um, and it never goes to rest, because that wasn't the problem. The problem was, I think I exist separate from my higher power. That's the problem. And because of that, I can get away with beating myself up as a separate entity. I can't beat myself up as the child of God. I can just enjoy it. There's no one to beat me up. So what does the ego look like? It's fun to speculate. Because it's just a term that we've come up with to attempt to explain the inner conflict that goes on inside of us. And what makes us different is we're aware of the inner conflict that's going on. I mean, we, we say to ourselves, why am I beating myself up? <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? So we know that we're beating ourselves up. It's not like we're an animal that's gone crazy and we just keep banging our head into a wall. We're fully aware that we're doing it, and we're trying to figure out why. I wonder why I'm banging my head. This is really hurting me. I ought to stop one of these days, but I'm not sure what it is. And this is going on. So
if I, uh, now, if I were to try and picture my ego, I already have a name for it. The name of my ego is Frank Morgan. Ah, some people know who Frank Morgan was. He was the Wizard of Oz. He was the actor that played the Wizard of Oz. He was the guy, little guy, remember him? And it was long, he somehow wandered up and ended up in there, and then he got behind the screen and was putting on a show, and then it caught on, and then everybody went, whoa. And uh, that was a hell of a show. He had everybody, had witches coming. You remember, ooh, and people are running, and the wizard, and you got to go to the wizard, and they took a little girl, a little child, to see through the show. And they finally went, you know, God, we're, this is the end of the world. Now the hordes are coming. Now the hordes are coming. She said, is there somebody behind that screen? And the screen fell over, and there he is. Whoa, whoa. That's just what it's going to look like when we finally confront the ego. Oh, you got me. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You didn't, you didn't really believe all that, did you? I was just... <laughs> I was just kidding. I, I... <laughs> Don't be mad at me. <laughs> That's pretty hard to believe that there's a Wizard of Oz show going on inside of each of us. What do you think it is? Now that we've seen, we've been given a glimpse. And we've been given desperation. Now we got the two, remember we started with the two bookends. Step one, step 12. That's the Magic. That's the magic kingdom. Are those two ingredients. A glimpse and desperation. And the assurance that if we ever went back and tested that desperation again, it's going to get more desperate. So that we are kept together by those two forces. And just those two forces can keep us sober for many, many years. Many, many, many. And then we have each other. And that can keep us sober and pretty happy forever. But not going beyond the glimpse. This is where the individual seeking takes over. To go from pretty darn good to beyond pretty darn good. And that's not going to happen generally out of desperation, although we can have events in our sobriety, our wife dying or leaving or just going into a depression or something that could push us to get another glimpse. But mostly it's going to come from listening to an inner yearning that takes us somewhere. And that's one of the main reasons that we like to discourage groups. And we don't have many local people from Tampa. Mainly, it is one or two people. A lot, of it, a lot of you came alone. You came because something told you to come. And that's why the energy among you is so much fun. I see you at the tables over there, and it's just so animated. It's almost like, why don't we cancel all the lectures and just stay in the chow hall? <laughs> We'd probably do a lot better, and maybe would. I don't, I don't know. I like staying in there. But what are you talking about at this table? What are you guys doing over here? Which is entirely different that if, that if I took 10 of my best friends that I hang around with all the time, and then we went up in the mountains, we'd still be talking at the level. You know how what I'm saying? There's the hanging around, and then there's the, 
I'm just going there to see what the deal is. I, I, and so there came a time when I looked at the Dalai Lama and said, why not? That's all I said. I looked at Alan Watts. I read, I've read his book, The Book. Scott recommended to me many times, and I looked, I looked in there, and I went, Jeez, there's something in me that says, this is it. And, and I, it was just so exciting. It was almost like part of me knew I was coming home. I'd just been given the map to come home. And then I'd put the book down, and then the other part. You don't believe that crap, do you? Don't you... Don't you think that's a little far-fetched? It's so easy to f- tear yourself down. You, what makes you think you deserve anything like that? Isn't there in there? Sure is. This is um, a revolution. It's almost an armed revolution. We're going to overthrow the current government. And it ain't going without a fight. It's been running you and me forever. Ever since we bought into the illusion that we exist separate from our higher power. And that buying in, I'll tell you when I think it happens, this is just me, I sit in my bed at night and I go, I wonder when that happened. And I think it's when whatever age people are showing us things like a teddy bear and a rattle and a little train. Ooh, 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 ooh. And then, oh, here's something else, here's something else. And then one day they go to take the bear away and give us the train and we go, mine. Mine. Now there's something there in addition to the child of God. There's a mine. And then that takes over. You see the difference? Up till then, whatever this spirit, see we're a spiritual being having a human experience. So we open our eyes as a spiritual being, we go, whoa, 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 look at this, look at this, look at this. And it's wonderful. And then that day that we go mine, We've decided that that is mine, and it's wrong for them to take it away from me. And we just improve on that story. Now there's me and them, and they're trying to get my teddy bear. They're trying to get my yacht. They're trying to get, they're trying to get my country. They're trying to get, who are they, and who are they getting it away from? Remember the leaf on the tree? There, the other leaves are trying to screw it up for me. He's part of those other leaves. He, <laughs> you, can, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have a separate address from the tree. I'm post office box three on the tree. <laughs> I got that leaf's mail. I mean, what is that? You see what I'm saying? And, and so we have established this so strongly that it's hard to believe that we could have fooled ourselves this long. And so when people come along and say, the real world is like these holograms, and when you see it, then you realize it's been there all along. And that's what we're trying to communicate and what the whole program is trying to afford us the entree to is a whole way of going into that world and dropping this world the power that this world has over us and only feel the power of our creator. 
Well, then how am I supposed to get along in this world? What did Chuck say? I spent 29 years expecting guidance. That's how you get along. You know, now they got this, what is it, GPS or whatever it is. They got satellites up there, and everybody knows exactly where they are at all times. What if we had told the guys in the wagons going west that someday there'd be (laughs) something orbiting up there that would tell them exactly within a foot and a half of where they are? Or Lewis and Clark, forget the Indian guides. Trust the, trust the satellite up there. <laughs> we go, what? What? Yeah, there's a thing orbiting, and it watches you when it goes by, and if you ask it, it'll tell you where you are. Now, he can't see it. He not know anything about that. It'd be pretty hard to believe in it. So we're sitting here today with the proposition, hey, there's this invisible higher power, and if you will totally turn your life over to it, just take a tan, it'll walk you through the rest of your life, and it'll be wonderful. Yeah. Now watch inside. Are you kidding? Are you really going to try that? (laughs) Warning, warning, warning. Danger, danger, maniac at the wheel. (laughs) He's thinking of trying this crap. Danger, danger, danger. There goes my money. There goes my car. There goes my job. There goes everything. Warning, warning. Do not trust God. Do not trust God. Do you hear that? (laughs) So, (laughs) what we hope when we try to see that everything that comes up, warning, 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 we just go, oh, that's just separation from God. That's just separation. That's that one problem manifesting itself in many different ways that we can start. You see, all we want to do is quiet the resistance, which is what willingness is. Quiet the resistance have an open mind, open mind. This sign right behind me is how to have an open mind. That was the, uh, there's a teacher, an enlightened, whatever you want to call it, awakened type of person. And um, he was in formal meditation and uh, training for 15 years, et cetera, et cetera. And then he decided, I'm just going to directly awaken. Called it the direct path. That's it. That's the entire program right there. You just always allow everything to be. Now, of course, in order to allow everything to be as it is, most of you has to stop commenting and talking (laughs) and having opinions about everything. And quieting that is not easy. But there it is. None of it can happen without what I just read. Visualizing our own spiritual objective. Because any of you start a business? Any of you start a new hobby? Any of you envision... Mike built something to carry his plane out with pontoons on it. He has it in his garage. That's almost like you started with something and then manufactured it, and now he has this machine that picks up his plane with pontoons on it and puts it in his lake. And he envisioned that. He says, you know, I need something. I got the garage. I I need that. So he envisioned it, and the envisioning caused it to happen. It just The strange part about spirituality is once we envision awakening, the most powerful way to get there is something that is way beyond positive thinking. Positive thinking can get some amazing results, but there's something that is um, 
probably a thousand times more powerful. It's called not thinking. <laughs> no thinking. Now, why would we want to do no thinking? Because there's nothing to know. There's nothing to learn. There's nothing to be figured out. It is only there to enjoy. It's already there. So in order to get there, we have to stop thinking and just be. I saw some of us sitting by the pond. Maybe you were sitting at the different stations of the cross. And you found yourself just taking it in. Taking it in is done without thinking. You're just like you take a breath in. You just take it in. And then you can let it go. And then you take it in. And then you let it go. You don't comment on it. You don't editorialize about it. You just... And so there's a state that many people write about, which is called not knowing. The wonderful place of not knowing. And the final thing that I'd like to tack on the end of this, and they all fit together, science, both science and religion, have tremendous knowledge about the past and the future. Scientists are getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to agreeing about the origin of the universe. And they're getting closer and closer and closer to imagining what the end, if there is an end, or is it going to come back together, or is it going to expand forever. They're really getting where they're starting to agree and as Bill wrote in the um, big book, scientists are fortune, forcing nature to disclose her secrets. And uh, I, I've been watching them force the secrets out of nature since I was a little kid. And once they squeeze another one out, they go, we got it. We're this close to everything. And then they find a black hole. And they go, what the hell is that? So they run and they run and they run. Don't worry, don't worry. We're this close. We just got to get around the black hole and we got to get there. And, uh, and then they go, okay, we're starting to get it. We're starting to get it. What is that? What's that? What's a quark? Why is a quark a neutrino? What are they doing down there? They're behaving differently when we're watching them. What does that mean? But we're this close. Don't worry. We're, give us another week. We're going to have this. A thousand years from now, we're going to be, we're this close. We're this close. So, but anyway, the, the, and the same thing with religion. That will give us the history. They tell us how it originated. And all of this is wonderful, and we need it. And the future. And there's heaven, and you might go there, and this is what's going to happen, and etc. The only thing they leave out where there's very little study is the now. The present moment. And the only thing that can study that, not study it, but takes us there, is spirituality. The spiritual moment is where everything takes place. And the smaller it is, the more powerful it is. I couldn't understand when they were talking about the development, because I was a little kid, of the atomic bomb. And I said, what are they going to build it out of? I remember that was the thing. What are they going to build it out of that will make it so big, big, big? Well, I guess it was afterwards. And they said, what did they build it out of? They're going to split an atom. I said, well, how big is an atom? Oh, man, you can't even see the damn thing. That's how small it is. I said, so inside of the smallest thing there is, is all this power? Yes, it's in there. It's, it's, you have to split it in order to get it. So what do you think is in the now? I think <laughs> it's just like a wormhole in space. 
that they talk about. You go from that part of the universe to that part of the universe. You can get there in that moment. How do you get to now? You have to let go of everything that isn't now. Let go of everything that isn't now. And if it really was, in other words, this is everything, and you just go like this, it would happen. We have to pry our fingers open. Everything that constitutes the ego is what has to be let go of. And it just ain't letting go without a fight, which is why the seventh step talks about pain. The pain of letting go. The pain of giving up the kingdom. Okay, I'll give you Rhode Island. <laughs> but I'm keeping Oklahoma and Texas. And I got to give up Oklahoma. You, you follow what I'm saying? It just, and the more territory that we concede, the bigger the glimpse gets. So I hope this weekend, in some small way, causes us to redefine our spiritual objective. Your spiritual objective, because it's just yours. Matters not what the gentleman behind you does. You'll be happy for him, but it'll have no effect on you. So you're the seeker. That's what, what does it say? That word is used a lot in our program. When we read chapter 5, what's the last word? Sought. Could and would. There's God. You want to go? You want to see the whole kingdom? Okay, so it's up to me. If he were sought, sought through prayer and meditation, seeker, God-seeking missile, that's our focus. Maybe it gets sharpened here, and you open your eyes. I forget where Bill wrote that. We open our eyes to an unlimited view or whatever it is. And I think that's it. Lift our eyes towards something we never dreamed we would set for ourselves. We're at the end of the time. Let's hang around and visit a little bit, and then we got a break until um, after lunch. Thank you all for your attention. Okay, we'll go ahead and start the question and answer uh, portion of our weekend. And when we say question and answer, first we got to understand there is no the answer to anything. What you will get is what it looks like from my perspective today when the subject comes up. It's a different answer than I would have given 20 years ago. And it might be different from what I'm going to give 20 years from now. So all you're hearing is what Scott and I are seeing today. And this is our honest evaluation of what it looks like to us. So that's all you're getting. So you can't walk away and say, well, I just heard the truth. <laughs> this may... This may lead you toward your own truth, but the, there's, the truth never comes out of a little piece of paper. So with that in mind, let's, Scott asked me to start, so I'm going to choose this one. How do we reconcile being true to ourselves with getting rid of self? Well, that sounds like a paradox. Uh, we have to start with the premise that getting rid of self is being true to ourself. In other words, that course of action automatically leads to the truth, in, in, if you follow what I'm saying. 
if we took being true to ourselves and weren't careful with it, would be listening to our ego for advice. What do you think we should do? <laughs> and we will be following the course we've been following. So true to our own self, I know we say that, but it has to be the ego-less self that we're referring to. So when people ask me, I hope I'm not stealing another question, they say, how do I know if it's God's will? I say, ask somebody else if they think it is. Hey, do you think it's God's will for me to leave my wife and go to Guatemala with this cute little girl? Because last night it felt like it was. <laughs> and if I'm true to myself, I'm out of I'm here. So... I think that's what, what I see today in, in, in terms of that. And, of course, it goes back to what Chuck was saying. There's only one problem, and that is conscious separation. Um, I think that's it. Scott, you draw one. That's a great question. I have been sober many years and still struggle with negative inner dialogue telling myself I should be this I should do that I should eat this I should have more what's the best way to calm this inner inter, uh, inner dialogue <coughs> I don't know and um and now I'm going to tell you what I do. And what I mean by I don't know is I don't know what you should do. I really don't. I, I uh, have come up with some of the single greatest uh, uh, resolutions for problems for everyone in AA, and somehow they haven't been adopted uh, by GSO. I, I, I'm still befuddled by this, uh, but what the hell can you do? Um, I resent Scott for being overweight. It affects my self-esteem, pocketbook, ambition, personal relations, and sex. What are the defects in me that if God would remove, the resentment would be gone? Well, I'm a glutton. I have low self-esteem. I'm stubborn. I'm playing God. I'm not trusting in God. I'm not living in today. I'm ashamed. Is that enough? That's enough to die from. Right? I don't need much more than that. I'm resentful at Scott for never having any money, for making more money and falling deeper into debt. It affects my self-esteem, pocketbook, ambition, personal relations, and sex. What are the defects in me that have been would be gone? Because I don't just dislike this. I re-experience the hatred. I re-experience it so that when I wake up, I water the resentment like a little flower. I want to make sure that it's developing properly. <laughs> the worst thing is when I forget to hate something, you know, and a guy says, hi, and I go, hi. Oh, I hate him. Why did I do that? <laughs> Damn, now I'm going to have to redouble my snubbing and looming just to, like, get back to where we were. Um, I, <laughs> I, I hate so that it eats my brain and my heart and turns my life black. That's my inner dialogue. Welcome to the Scott Redman Inner Dialogue Workshop. It's like when I snore. You're a loser. You're from a long line of losers. You're an asshole, and you'll never amount to anything. <laughs> That's the way I sleep. So um, <laughs> uh, these resentments against myself, uh, it says in our book, it says, when it was remorse, we were sore at ourselves. I have had to be extremely attentive to, and I have had to seek guidance. I've had to write the, uh, um, the inventory that I just described about sex, about, um, you know, I'll never forget when I got off a podium, I, it was one of the first long talks I ever gave, and this female newcomer walked up to me and complimented me on the talk, and she walked away, and I thought, oh, she thinks I'm nice. Oh, no. <laughs> if she could have peeked into my brain for one second, she would have gone screaming into the street um, because I wanted to, you know, show her the serenity sausage. That's pretty much what I wanted to do. I didn't... Uh, I... Uh, that was the teaching for the day that I really, uh, I wanted to lay it down. 
You know, and if anyone's going to, you know, do something to her, it ought to be a nice guy, don't you think? Um, my, <laughs> my ability to think my way around reality is, is unbelievable. And one of the ways that I do it is um, I love him. He, he loves me. I know this. I know that we love each other. If you took what I'm apt to say about myself in the course of a day or a week and stack it up about what he thinks of me, it's absurd. It can't take place on the same planet. And I posed this question to men I sponsor lately. We do it on our retreat, and I'm going to do it again in a couple of weeks. Why am I so willing to believe the worst about myself? I'm not, I don't feel that way about you. I don't. I don't feel that way about the men I love. When they call me, I don't go, Aww. <laughs> you know. There are a few of those guys too, believe me. But um, um, and it, it is. It, it's this learned, uh, driven, um, miserable self-assessment that keeps me safe from a lot of the wonderful things that life has to offer. (laughs) So for me, I have had to do that inventory. I've had to read that inventory about sex, about food, about money, about uh, being a a father, about being a sponsor, about allowing myself to be sponsored. Now, is this self-obsession? Absolutely not. The time that I spend doing this is a fraction of the time that I used to spend pillaring myself Uh, uh, calling myself to task. It's a tiny, tiny bit of it. Here's self-obsession. Writing it and not changing. That self-obsession is the continual writing, 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 and then then not using six and seven as a fulcrum for change. That's self-obsession. The self-examination is not as long as I'm using it to kind of supercharge and super energize this incredible metamorphosis Alcoholics Anonymous has to offer me. Thank you so much. How does one pursue the benefits of the discipline offered by a particular religion or school of spirituality without becoming closed off to what is offered by other traditions. Other traditions, what do you think that is? Oh. Discipline offered by a particular religion or school of spirits without becoming closed off to what is offered. Oh. Well, one thing that we understand is if spirituality is the top of the mountain, you can get there up any side. And you get the same view. And so if you find the path that you like, then you only are concerned with you getting to the top. And you wish well to everybody else and hope they get there. They're not mutually exclusive. We are perfectly free to wish. Bill writes it in our theme. He says if there's somebody else gets a way to get people sober, we're going to hope they do great. We don't want to control it. So far, nobody has. But, um, and he goes out of his way to say, we don't have any exclusive insight or spiritual territory. We just have found something that for some reason, being passed on from drunk to drunk is solving a problem that has never been solved before. And uh, we're just perfectly willing to give it for nothing to anybody that wants it. So I think there's no problem of uh, mutual exclusivity or whatever that term is, that um, whatever path we're on, it's fine that they're on another one. There's no right path. We all get to the top of the mountain. We can all shake hands, and then we can talk about our trip. Well, I went through the synagogue, and I got up here, and I went through here, and I went and got in a straitjacket, and 
I came from there. And so you can see it, it, that we're all getting up there one way or the other. Go ahead, Scott. <clears throat> why did we start to say the Lord's Prayer at the end of meetings, and why do we continue to? The uh, other prayers from the literature and the serenity prayer feel more representative of the spiritual principles of the program and also feel less Christian. Um, I, uh, um, I don't know, um, but this is my experience with it. Um, I was brought up Jewish, and uh, the Lord's Prayer uh, scared me, and, uh, but it didn't scare me more than alcoholism, so I just held someone's hand and mumbled until I learned it. And, uh, um, uh, I, uh, <laughs> uh, I personally uh, do, do not believe the Lord's Prayer should be used at AA meetings. Uh, I think it's a big mistake. Um, uh, and uh, that being said, uh, when it's said at the end of a meeting, uh, I say it. Uh, and I'll take it a step further. I have a workshop that meets at my house one day a week. And one of our biggest courses of study is uh, the Lord's Prayer from Emmett Fox's book, Sermon on the Mount. If you have not read this piece of literature, run, don't walk to get it. it it's a life-changing experience. And um, in it, Fox, in the back of the book, takes the Lord's Prayer one sentence at a time, and he writes a chapter on each sentence. And the chapter that he writes on, uh, on forgiveness is mind-boggling. You can really tell how our guys were going to see him at the church and going to see him at Carnegie Hall, and they were reading him. It's so clear. They, we couldn't have written... The, chapter 5 doesn't exist without this piece of literature. It just doesn't. What he writes about resentment is extraordinary. And one of the things he writes, and I love doing this at workshops, is he says how, if you're not forgiving someone, how can you continue to say this prayer? I always think that if he was Jewish and he had that inflection, he would have said, you should choke on the words. They should, you should choke on it. It shouldn't, shouldn't even come out of your mouth, you know. Because uh, um, uh, it, he really does say that. He says, it's crazy that you continue to say this when you're not, uh, when you're not forgiving people. And I always listen at the end, and it's always, and it's, all, it's a little alcoholic, because everybody, I think, says it a little louder, just to go, hey, hey, you know, kind of. I always think it should be, you should hear a lot less people saying the prayer at the end, but that's just me. Uh, at any rate, um, I've been to meetings in Asia, and uh, the idea of saying the Lord's Prayer in Asia it would be bizarre. It would be a bizarre concept. It's... Uh, Buddhist house, you know, the places that I've been, you know. Uh, to say that it's not a Christian prayer is comical. Um, I, I don't want to cause any controversy, and I really can't, because this is question and answer, and you're not going to share during the meeting. Uh, um, and, uh, and if you, it really pisses you off, what I want to urge you to do is see him after the meeting and say, why the hell did you ask him to talk during this? This has really pissed me off. Um, so... <laughs> At any rate, I, uh, um, uh, it, it's, uh, the other thing I just want to say is that every meeting has its tradition. Every meeting is autonomous. Every meeting has the right approach for the meeting. And I love respecting individual meetings' right to do it their way. They have the right to do it, and to quote my good friend, even if their um, decision is remarkably stupid. Um, uh, they, they do have the right. So that's my comment on it. Thank you. That was great. Okay. Sandy. Well, I'm glad I got this one. <laughs> Thanks so much for your wisdom, serenity, and bright light. Blah, blah, blah. I, oh, I wrote this myself. <laughs> I was just kidding, Chris. I didn't want you to actually put it in the basket. <laughs> Whoever it is, thank you. 
How, how do you move this spiritual insight from your head to your heart? Uh, know it makes sense. Really believe, feel, and be. How do you move it? Just going through the motions um, is not working. What else is needed? How do you really get it? Well, I think Chuck said something that we may have uh, thought was very light when he was talking. He said we do it for fun. Now that's a very important change in how you may be approaching this. Well, I gotta move it from my head to my heart. It's not going. I, well, I have to force it. I have to do this. This does not look like fun. <laughs> so, what did he say later on? It's a game. <clears throat> okay, the game from the head to the heart. From the head to the heart. Well, I, so far I'm still in jail. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll roll the dice again. Dee, 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 dee. So now, even though we're still there, we're still fun. And you'll see, it'll come loose. It's fun. It's fun, we're still in our head. Look at me, I'm still in my head. Ha, 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 ha. Light, 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 light. It's a game. Thanks. That was great, Sandy. Thanks. Okay, this doesn't have a lot of moving parts. This is... <laughs> I have found it hard to maintain a consistent daily meditation time. What have you learned that helps you to be con consistent? Um, uh, 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 one of the teachers I've been led to is a Jesuit priest named Anthony DeMello. If you haven't read him or listened to him, I, I would urge you to take a look at him. He's had a big, big impact on me. And um, he, uh, there's one set of tapes. I only think there's one set of tapes. It was a, a, a failed attempt to videotape him at Fordham University in uh, New York, but they got the, the audio track from it. It's called Wake Up to Life. And uh, it's available a lot of different places. Uh, Dicobi has it and stuff like that. And it just had a huge impact on me. And uh, one of the things that DeMello does is he really, he doesn't call it this, but from my, my readings of Emmett Fox, I came to really see that he was talking about, uh, you know, the Christ message of resist not evil. Uh, of stop taking oaths, stop making schedules, stop, stop it. You know, he says, <laughs> Fox says something so iconoclastic, probably really excited Rome a lot. He said, any religion that takes a, a lifelong oath is missing the point. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, any, and it's basically, again, you can see our framers, re, you know, listening to Fox and reading them, the whole one day at a time concept is so hooked into his interpretation and observations on the Sermon on the Mount, it's pretty remarkable, resist not evil, you know, and um, uh, so... In, in DeMello's talk, he talks about being with a priest who's in his 90s and who says to DeMello, they're kind of talking, and the priest, who's a muckety-muck in, in, uh, in the church, says to DeMello, for 60 years, not once have I missed my meditation time in the morning. Not one single time in 60 years. And DeMello says, boy, it sounds like an obsession. <laughs> Which I don't think was the reaction the guy was looking for, really. I think he was looking for a gold star or something like that. And um, I have bullied myself and called myself a failure for missing deadlines and deciding on prayer structures and meditation structures and stuff like this. And it's exactly, my feeling now is exactly what Sandy was talking about, light, light, light.
You know, 12 step work is challenging, it's difficult, it's heartbreaking at times. At the end of the day, it should be very pleasurable and enjoyable. Uh, a, 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 a real practice, a spiritual practice, something that you can do so that when things go, when you get cancer or when, you, when things happen, you stand back and go, oh, my practice is in place. There's nothing for me to do. I'm just hitching a ride. I'm already there. That's what Sandy talks about, uh, Chuck saying this to him years ago. You're already there. You've got nowhere to go. You're already there. Yeah, but I want to go here and everything. Fine, do all that. You can do all that. You know, it's like that crazy idea I used to have. What do you want to do in sobriety? Well, I like to write well. I like to have some sex like this. Like like make, make a little money. You can do all of that. Let me ask you a question. Do you have to suffer until you get it? Well, yeah. Yeah, I do. I, uh, if I don't suffer, Chris ain't going to suffer. He's going to suffer till he gets his. He's not going to suffer till I get mine, you know. He's not that nice. Uh, and um, the crazy idea there is that the deal, this is a design for living, that I think somehow my suffering is going to purchase the thing I crave. Beautiful way to live. Uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, So I feel that way about these goals, about meditation and about prayer. These are difficult. They're painful at times. At times, meditation's painful. And at the end of the day, it should be a pleasurable, enjoyable experience. Thanks, Scott. A typed one. I grew up in an alcoholic home and thrived on excitement until I entered Al-Anon 12 years ago. In Al-Anon, we have a saying, don't just do something, sit there. I'll tell you, that's a great one. I've learned to pray silently and meditate. Do you have any other suggestions for doing nothing well? Well, I think this statement we have on the board as a monumental plan of action. Look at that huge plan of action. (laughs) Simply allow everything to be as it is. I'm getting worn out, are you? Man, I'm sitting here just letting everything be the way it is. Wow, getting tired. You, You can see why that is doing well. I think about that when they run the thing prior to the movies getting started, urging people to not talk during the movies. That's what I'm being urged to do vis-a-vis my life. Don't talk during your life so that you can enjoy it. Don't interrupt with thinking about it then you won't be able to see the movie very well. As a matter of fact, I started a few years ago in Tampa, and now everybody's picking up on it, that they come to me with a problem. Well, I got this and I got this. And I said, okay, what I think you should do is go to the movies. Go to the movies? Yeah, just go to the movies. As a kid, didn't you like the movies? I used to look forward to the movies. I'm going to the movies, I'm going to the movies, I'm getting popcorn, I'm going to sit in the movie and buy the ticket and then go out in front and just look up and go, God, uh, the movie's about two hours and 30 minutes. I'm going to be in there. Can you watch everything while I'm in there? Because I'm just going to go to the movie. And then you come out And he really did, I don't know how he does it, but he gets more stuff straightened out while I'm in the movie, which is doing nothing well. I think I said earlier in in that last lecture that there's something much more powerful than positive thinking, and that's not thinking. Not thinking, just being. Just be. We're here, we're in the room. Nobody wants to be somewhere else. Just right here. What's he going to say next? 
You know, I sit here and I go, oh boy, he's going to take a question out. Oh boy, I'm going to watch what he says. Is that fun? That's what it's supposed to all be. Now, I could be sitting here going, what if he gives a better anthem than I do? I shouldn't have asked him up here. I could ruin this for me. You follow what I'm saying? So, over. Thank you, Sid. That was great. By the way, that was a great question. That was very deep. When I have finished a difficult task or accomplished a goal, I do not feel happiness or gratitude for long. I instantly focus on the next task or goal, and that makes me feel that I'm always on the run and struggling against problems. Right here, right now. Right here, right now. In the moment. It's all I got. The past is nothing. The future is absolute vapor. All I have is in the moment. Can you think of anything that does not take place in the moment? Anybody? Pardon me? There is no fear in the past and no fear in, in the future of any kind. I'm not scared that you might hit me. I'm scared that you hit me. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not scared that you, you... I'm not scared that you've hit me unless you've hit me. There's no fear in the past or the future. There's nothing exists. And even if I, if I do choose to be frightened of it, I'm frightened of a vapor. I'm frightened of an idea. Nothing, there is, there, I, I, again, I, I, I challenge anybody to come up. And, you know, I want to tell you about the, the fear. You know, I, I go through this with guys I sponsor. I have a pretty big palate today, a much bigger palate than I used to. And you hear people, I hear people go, it's all uh, self, uh, uh, it, it's all, I'm fear-based. But, you know, I'm carbon-based, and uh, I, uh, uh, it's all about fear. Fear is worse than resentment. You know, the fact is, is now that I've been sober for a while, if a shark comes toward me, I don't get scared. I get alarmed. You know, I have a big palate. I have fear. I have alarm. I have reasonable anxiety. I have excitement. There's about 15 different things that fall in that bucket now that I used to just classify as fear because I'd go from coma to Mach 10. There was nothing, there was no gray area at all, you know. So I've had to be wary of that. And as guys do fear inventories, a lot of stuff gets slapped on there that really I don't think is fear at all. Um, that, that being said, when I uh, multitask, I'm not in the moment something closed while I'm pulling something open, while I'm thinking of the next thing that I'm going to do, I'm not in the moment. Uh, if there's anybody here who thinks that they're going to be on their deathbed and they're going to look up from their deathbed and say, damn, I wish I'd been at the office more. I'd like to talk to you after the meeting. You know, if there is such a human being here, my heart goes out to you. And um, uh, there's, there's nothing like a real, new, horrified horrifying drunk who has no facility whatsoever to live in the day, who's being tortured by what's to come, tortured by what has already happened, and is going mad. They are ravaged by thought. And when I still go through these things, I really have to take a look. If I, did I take, did I, you know, and I ask guys I sponsored, did you take the third step today? And if the answer is yes, my next question is, can you put your money where your mouth is? Can you actually really do this? Can you belly up and do this? Well, what do you mean? How do you do it? And then we talk about how to do it. You know, so this is a great question. I completely identify with it. And it's been my doorway to, uh, gateway to a lot of good feeling. And, uh, and if you ever get a chance and you haven't, uh, he's on our in our spiritual library, but Eckhart Tolle in The Power of Now speaks to the whole notion of living in the moment as well or better than anyone I've ever, ever been exposed to. Thanks, Scott. Whoops. Gee, that's... A... <laughs> that question only has three words in it. I, I think I'd rather work on that one. Anyway. 
Uh, before I get to this one, I want to say these are very good questions. Mm -hmm. They're excellent. Mm -hmm. They really have been thought about, and um, I'm, I just love it. At about 18 years sober, I think I need to change my sponsor. We don't work the steps together, and our relationship kiss, it consists of a lunch once every three months and a telephone call when my ass is on fire. <laughs> Bottom line, I don't feel actively sponsored. Should I change my sponsor? What should I look for at this stage of recovery? What are your thoughts about a sponsor in a different city? Well, I can only give you my experience. Um, when I sponsor people, the beginning of the sponsorship role is quite different from many years later. As a matter of fact, it looks something like that. It starts out with um, meeting once a week on the steps. We stay together for an hour. I give them a reading assignment. Then they come back the next week. And we both make a commitment to every Tuesday at 5 o'clock till we're finished. Finishing may take five months. Somewhere's in there. Where I have, we finished the book, we finished the steps, he's made the amends, and he's done all of that. At that point, I cancel the weekly meetings, and I say, call me anytime you want to get together, we will get together. Call me anytime with a question or with a situation that is bothering you. And always go to one or two meetings where I'm there so that I can see you. And then even if you didn't call, I will know that it's time to ask you what's wrong with your face. <laughs> And when we get your face back smiling, I will leave you alone because we're supposed to be smiling. At this point, we more or less are becoming friends. Um, and if I'm asked, in other words, I, we started this whole thing by reading out of the 11th step. It becomes an individual adventure. Now we're at the 11th set. We're, we're going to take the awakening and try to go further. I'm the one who comes to one of these and finds some authors and finds some guidance. At a certain point, you can't, the journey is me by myself. It's me because I'm journeying inward. I've, we've taken care of all the past and the amends and we've established relationships and et cetera. And so it's, this is the way I was sponsored and this is how I sponsor. I do not continually to minutely give directions and control uh, at all. That's just me. I, I, I don't say that's the right way. I can only pass on what I do. And it seems to work pretty well. Um, if someone that I've sponsored a long time ago, he's got 20 years sobriety, and he meets somebody who uh, really gives them great insight, they become friends, and they get together and have dinner and talk about <laughs> spiritual paths and all that. And I go, yay! That is, that is wonderful. So it does... Uh, then come down to, um, I ran into a dead end, I can't see my way out of this, and then we talk until the light comes back on, and then move on. So that's my experience. That's the only one I can give you. Thanks. Okay. Sandy, what about the sponsor in the other city thing that you Maybe I didn't understand that. Does that mean if, if you move to another city or should you have a sponsor in another city? I think it means long-distance sponsorship, I think. Oh, oh, oh. 
I'm sorry. Uh, the reason I didn't relate to that is I only sponsor people I got hands on. Right there, where, and that's one of the requirements. I have to see you in a meeting every week because I want to see your face. And so I only sponsor, I see, yeah. And there's lots of people who sponsor long distance and over the phone and all that. I'm not comfortable with that. I've never done it. So for me, it's um, I see you. Thanks, Andy. How do I attain freedom from want so as to feel whole? Um, I, 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 for me, the question is how do I attain freedom from craving so as to feel whole? Uh, I want plenty of stuff. That's not the problem. The problem for me is when I crave stuff. And when I crave it, and then my craving becomes an attachment and an identity. So uh, if it's uh, a material thing, or if it's something at work, or if it's something if my wife's not buying the right kind of lingerie, or if I need an upgrade to wife 6.0, or, uh, you know, something else is going on there, I... um, uh, uh, then uh, that's okay to want it, you know. That's the difference between reality and fantasy. That's why they call it a fantasy. Uh, it's a very adolescent notion, and it, you can see it in newcomers, and unfortunately, sometimes way into sobriety, where you think because you think something, you're going to do it. It's a very, very childish notion, which unfortunately we carry with us deep into sobriety sometimes. Um, that being said. Uh, when I want it, it's fine. That's a kind of a fleeting moment. If I start craving it and then I need it, uh, and then I form an attachment to it, and then the attachment starts burrowing its way in, and eating my brain like a worm, and um, and then it becomes my uh, my identity. Wanting that thing, attaining that thing, needing that thing, talking about that thing, meeting other people who want that thing and need that thing and are troubled by that thing. Then I just find a lot of people in AA who might be willing to talk to me about that thing. They look like they might be thinking about it right now, and my, my mind-reading skills guide me to those people. And, um, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a miserable thing. So this, you know, the Buddhists say that, you know, they, they'd like to stop suffering and not be afraid to die. I'll, I vote yes. I like to stop suffering and not be afraid to die. I think that's actually I, I really have attained that in a lot of ways. I really spend very little time suffering and I'm not afraid to die. Uh, and even better these days, I'm not afraid to live, which is really a, a good thing for me. Um, so uh, what I just described is a very long process. Just to want something is a fleeting moment to cra- and, and, and really not a problem. Because it's, again, a fleeting moment. To crave something, that's a long process of becoming obsessed, uh, be developing a craving, developing an attachment, and then turning it into an identity. And having it reverberate and sort of radiate through my entire life. And it starts coloring everything I do. That's a complicated, horrifying, corrosive process. And um, my protection against it is the inventory process, allowing myself to be sponsored, knowing that there's one guy that knows everything, and as I grow in sobriety, there's just less to know. Thank God. If I'm, if I'm 25 years in and there's just as much to know as when I was six months, please kill me. Um, I just don't, I can't take it. It's just, uh, just wear me out. So... I hope that's helpful, and I think that we've got so many safeguards against getting that deep that you really have to be unmindful of this for a long time to let it progress that that far. Here's the question. Who am I? I like to say it's only three words. I thought about this um, many times, how to answer that question. How many sentences can we think of that begin with, I am? I'm old. I'm hungry. I'm horny. I'm alive. I'm free. I'm... 
and we modify it with so many words that we become attached to the modifiers to find out who we are. I am, ah, just finish the sentence. And what we forget is you can have an entire sentence that says, I am, with a period after M. I am. And then, having eliminated all those modifiers, we can go inside to see what it is. And it's, it's that which is inside of us. It is the unmodified, which lends a great deal of credence to letting go. Once you let go of everything, we find out who we are. Unmodified. And the closer you get, the more you like the view. And the more you like you, because you got rid of the things that you aren't, that you were attached to. In other words, I don't think I've ever seen uh, uh, that sentence without something after the word am. Does anybody recall seeing I am? And so that would be my answer. It's a circuitous route, but it takes us to where the answer to that will be revealed. And then, as soon as I modified it, I wouldn't be giving you the answer. I hope that made sense. <laughs> Great work, because that had me stumped. I'll tell you that, pal. That was, that was great. What is your current clarification of God? Um, I will tell you my current experience of God. On um, on May 13th, I was diagnosed with liver cancer. And on uh, June 1st, I was operated on, and they opened me up, and they thought they had one tumor going, and they found about 10 tumors in me once they opened me up. And uh, my AA family was waiting for me in the waiting room with my kid and one of my kids and my wife. And the doctor came out and said, you know, uh, we don't know if he's going to survive this if we, because we're not prepped for this, so we could just, you know, close him up and move on. And Nancy said, uh, "I know him pretty good, and if you just close him up, he's going to be real pissed off. I, 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 uh, I, I, I guarantee it. If I have to look at him and say, honey, they found a whole lot of stuff and they closed you up, he's going to go nuts. He's not, and you tell him, you know. So at any rate." Uh, <laughs> Uh, everybody in the room went, do something. You're in there, d- do something. So uh, uh, it began this uh, journey that I've been on um, all of, you know, for these past, really, it's just a few months, the whole thing, and uh, talking to Sandy through it every step of the way, and my friend Steve and, and my friend Brent, and so many people have been just, just with me through the whole thing. And... Um, Here's the deal. I have spent 22 years in Alcoholics Anonymous, and not, and this is not a brag. This is my story. I've never wandered away in 22 years. I've been doing this practice for 22 years. I haven't spent any time wandering away, not going to meetings, not sponsoring people. That's just my story. So I have 22 years of consistent practice. This guy in my area used to, you know, sort of poo-poo time. What's the big deal with time? And this friend of mine used to say to him, you don't think that the time's a big deal. Why don't you get some? Uh, <laughs> this guy, my buddy of mine. That shit, I don't think he's talked since. Uh, at, at any rate, um, my son came to me in the hospital, and he said to me, you know, Dad, um, I get that you're okay. I've, I've been watching you my whole life, and I understand that you're all right. And uh, he said, but I'm not. So I, know, I need to know you're going to do something about this. And what happened was, is I realized that 
my practice had hardwired my experience of God in me, so I didn't have to do anything. I'm just along for the ride at this point. I didn't have to scramble to all of a sudden, maybe I should read the big book again. I, I, I didn't, I, oh, crap, you know, is there an express line around here somewhere? Because I'm in trouble. Um, I'm there. I'm, I'm there already. Just to quote Chuck again, I'm there, absolutely there already. So he and I are on the phone and we're talking about the exciting prospect of dying, about the prospect of living, about all of this stuff. And, um, and I'm kind of reporting every couple of days the new part of this adventure and, and, and what we're going through. This was not my dramatic plan. My plan was for the Scott Redman opera to begin, you know, uh, and there's no opera. There's, there's just no opera. So, uh, and then you get this great stuff, like I got a guy who calls me screaming because his new job gave him a small office, and I start laughing. <laughs> I, 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 um, I start laughing. He goes, what are you laughing at? I said, I have cancer, and you're a dick. Uh, um, so it gives you a little license to dig a little deeper with guys you know Um, so my uh, uh, in, in explaining what my most recent most powerful experience of God is I will tell you this has been my story as a member of AA. I watch people's experiences of God. Their definitions and their explanations of God have not been particularly useful for me, although I've enjoyed many of them. You know, enjoyed and have been enriched by many of them. Uh, It's it's when I watch somebody like Sandy and and my my friends uh, go through unbelievable, you know, stuff. So I hope that's helpful. That's great. Wonderful. Yeah. Just as a plant needs water to grow, a problem or worry needs attention to grow. How do you know the difference between not giving a problem attention and denial that could lead to a resentment or other problems down the road? I gotta read that again. <laughs> Just as the plant needs water to grow and the problem needs water to attention, how do you know the difference between not giving a problem attention and denial that could, oh, I see, B- between not giving a problem attention and denial that could lead to a resentment or other problems down the road? Hmm. Well, I think if I'm denying it, I need help to point out that I'm denying it. Because if I knew that I was denying it, I'd be really smart. You follow what I'm saying? I'd be beyond smart. In other words, the implication in the word is that I am fooling myself, and that's why we need each other. So, I ha- I've got my 43-year chip recently, and they said, well, how did you do it? And I said, um, constant, I want to stay in a constant state of receiving help. That's the secret. I want to stay in a constant state of receiving help. So I never want to assess my own situation by myself. So the beginning of this whole thing is, if there's some confusion inside of me, because it's real easy for someone else to see what's going on with me, and it's real easy for me to see what's going on with someone else. And so I just have a a, a litany of friends, Scott being one of them, Steve, people in Tampa, and um, if anybody is working, I know they're busy, 
and we have a little signal, and the signal is, can I run something by you? Which means I only expect to stay on the phone 45 seconds. And then I just go, and then they come right back, and they just go, you're seeing it wrong. You owe the guy an apology. Oh, really? Thank you. And then I hang up. So that I was given a perspective that I can't have with myself. And we were talking outside, uh, <laughs> and I said, um, I really think we greet each other wrong. That the way we greet each other is absolutely stupid. <coughs> we see each other and we go, hey, how you doing? And we really ought to say, hey, how am I doing? That's the way we ought to greet each other. Hey, how am I doing? And then we could find out how we're doing. And we wouldn't be asking ourselves. So that part of that is to get around to not feeding a problem. Um, if we could take a problem and somehow have the scientists be able to remove it from us so that we could study it under a microscope, we would find that it is composed entirely of thought. <laughs> They'd go, hey, this thing is 100% thought. And thought on its own starts to fade. And that's what happens to a problem. Yeah, I got a resentment against somebody who hurt me last month. If I let it six months go by, that little sucker could vanish. Heaven forbid it should vanish. So every couple of months you got to look back in there and refeel that slight that the guy gave you and pump it back up. Because left unattended, it just shrinks and shrinks. And so movies are the best for solving problems. You just leave them out there and go to the movies. Nothing should stand in the way of going to the movies. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing should ever stand in the way of going to the movies. You understand what happens when you go to the movies. The problem is no longer serious enough to keep you from going to the movies. You have given the problem the finger by just getting popcorn. Screw you, pal. <laughs> and it shrinks. It just shrinks. You automatically shifted the priority. It's no longer a problem. It's a, I forgot what the hell to call it. It's a situation that's out there, and I don't really need to do anything about it. Most things don't need anything done about them. They mainly need not thinking. Not thinking thinking. Anyway, that's it. That was great, Sandy. Thanks. Here you go. Oh, you got one? No. I'll slide it up. There we go. I just got a new pair of glasses. I can see much better with them, but they make me a bit dizzy. I started out wearing them an hour a day, but before too long, I'm wearing the old pair again. Even though the lenses fall out and the frames are broken, I keep wearing the old pair. Every time I put on the new pair, I think this is great, but before long, I'm wearing the old pair. What is up with this, and how do I get to the new pair? <laughs> Go to the movies. <laughs> you can't see the screen. <laughs> One of the things that has been, um, that, that, uh, and I think it's just because of so many of us have such a poor assessment of ourselves and such low self-esteem, um, uh, I've just seen over and over again alcoholics faulting themselves for not um, be, taking on new spiritual teachings in a way they think they should be adopting them as their new credo. 
And, um, and this gets extended to 10-step work, where guys I sponsor fault themselves for having to continue to write 10 steps. And they say, do you still write 10 steps? And I say, you'll know if I stop, because the first thing I want to do is not talk to you. <laughs> That's high on the list, will be not talking to you. Uh, <laughs> Because I'm not, because <laughs> I'm not going to be particularly interested in really anyone besides me. Uh, this is what keeps my eyes turned outward. So um, this, uh, the, it, I, I, I really need to, to urge patience and time. These are big life movements that we make when we take on these new glasses, these new lessons, these new applications, these new teachings. You know, I've been mentioning lots of teachings, and I've been doing this over a period of years. This is, wasn't happening me last week that I did these, the last five teachers that I did. This has been happening to me slowly over a long, long period of time. And, you know, the other thing is, is we can take things... This goes under the don't take yourself too damn seriously. Um, I called him one day. I was in really bad shape. And um, he said to me, and we'll talk about this problem. And he says, uh, all right, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to God's, God's ready room. I said, what? He said, well, it's like a pilot. Pilots go before they go on a, a mission. They go to the ready room. They have their boards. They fill out their stuff. They get their coordinates and all that stuff and their orders. And they go and they go. So I want you to show up God's ready room. I said, okay. So you want you to go to God's ready room. God's going to come in. He's going to address all you pilots. And he's going to say, okay, who's in for pain? I need a volunteer for pain. I want your arm to shoot up and say, count me in. I'm in for pain. I said, great. Okay, so make it part of your prayers. Father, I'm in for pain. Count me in. So that's what I do. I start doing it every morning. Father, I show up. I'm at the ready room in my head. I'm doing this thing. I'm, I'm in for pain, and it's changing my life. I start selling franchises to God's ready room. I'm setting one up in Vegas. I am uh, selling little flight jacket pins and, um, uh, and little boards that you got to clip onto and stuff. And about three months later, uh, he and I are talking, and I wonder, well, it's kind of like God's ready room. He said, what? I said, what do you mean, what? God's ready room, that thing you do. He said, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. It was just his way of saying, have a good day. You know, it was, uh, it was kind of his thing. You know, boy, now I can, I can go to the movies now that he's off my back. And, uh, light, light, light. You know, light, light, light. And this stuff that I took on seriously, and I really did take it on heavy. And he took it on about as light as you could take it. And he didn't retain it. That's pretty light. Uh, um, <laughs> retention's the first sign of taking it seriously. Um, uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's important. So, and, and especially with these, these new teachings, we, we give ourselves such a hard time when we could be going, hey, you know what, I've started playing with this new toy. It's going to take a while to find out where the buttons and all this right stuff is going to be, and let's see where this fits into the whole scheme. Terrific. Terrific. By the way, we may not finish all of these, and anybody who, uh, whose question didn't get answered, if you... Uh, want to retrieve it and put your name and address on the back and give it to me, I'll send you a written answer. Would you send them one, too? I'll send it to you. <laughs> no, I'll send it. I'm okay. Send it. So I, I will do it. And just hand it to either one of us. How do we draw the line between people-pleasing and, as Chuck C. would have us do, keeping people happy? Well, I think we do people-pleasing to make ourselves happy. So it's selfish. The other way is just having fun. You just tell them to go to God's ready room. <laughs> it, it, in other words, Chuck is talking about out of self, out of self. And... Um, just imagine, just like he said, imagine 
that we really are God's kids, how would I behave if I really was God's kid? I would just go, what do you want me to do? And then I'd run over there because I'd know he's real. And I'd just take care of that. And you, Chuck used to say, and he told me, he said, you know, it's not your job to take care of yourself. That's God's job. You just go out and do what he assigned you each day. And I went, um, really? I think I'll still keep a couple hundred dollars in my wallet just in case he isn't going to take care of me. You know what I'm saying? In other words, it was almost, and I said, um, I thought God took care of those that take care of themselves. No, he doesn't do that. He takes care of everyone. Anybody who asks him, he'll take care of. And so here we have keeping people happy. You can't get any happier than that. You can't get any happier than that. I um, was in the Big Brother program, and then he finally grew up and went on. So I got in the hospice program. I'm very fascinated with um, death and the um, meaning that it has and how essential it is. The biggest cause of death is birth. And um, <laughs> they go together like corn and chowder. Hey, you can't have one without the other. Do, 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 do. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to see. Yeah. Um, Many people say the biggest weapon the ego has against us is death. And you know the only person that dies is the ego, so no wonder there's a big deal about death. Hey, hey. We go on forever. We're in, Chuck said it. Infinite father, infinite children, infinite journey. On and on and on. This is beep. 70 years. It's like boop. Just time to learn a quick lesson and get back in the chorus line up there. Da, da, da. So over at hospice, this is, this is the, the people over there are just remarkable. I'm going through training, and it went on for a long time. The nurses and the counselors and the, all the rules and this and that. And they just happened to mention in passing 50% of all people who are in the hospital, in a nursing home, wherever, old folks' home, whatever you want to call it, by themselves, never get one visitor, ever. Okay, so let's say that someone went to see one of those persons once a week for an hour. That moment in their lives would be the highlight of the whole week. And then when that one ended, they would wait for the next hour, the following week. You would add so much. So anyway, um, the, the latest one um, <laughs> with, with is an alcoholic. And um, the alcoholic is a 50-year-old woman who lives with her <laughs> 80-year-old grandmother who can barely see has had heart problems. <laughs> so I'm really there with the grandmother. You, you follow what I'm saying? And I'm really teaching her how to be an al -Anon and get rid of the daughter <laughs> and go have a happy life of her own. Now, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this is, so what do I do? I'm there for three hours and the daughter may come in and make a scene and go back and pass out in her bedroom. <laughs> and I can teach the grandmother how to not give a damn. You know what I mean? What do you care? You know, let her go in there. It's alcoholism, there's nothing you can do about it, et cetera. So I've listened to her life. And she grew up in England during the Blitz. She's a little feisty gal, and she served in the rich lords homes and did the cooking and the sweeping and she knew all of the th what silverware goes here and there and they married to some guy who was a thief spent his life in prison married an alcoholic i mean just the, you know the drama 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 and so it's quite fascinating you actually make a movie out of that life 
So I've been doing that about three months. And one day she said to me, you're the first person who ever listened to my life. She's 80. I'm a freaking drunk. It's over there just trying to do something. I mean, I'm just over there. I'm laughing. The daughter's coming in and out. I, was, I mean, it, she had tears in her eyes. Life shouldn't happen where no one ever hears you. You could hear somebody. And um, you will be transformed. It's out of self into others. And then suddenly, everything's revealed to you. It, is, um, it just happens. Just like Chuck was talking about. Just go have fun. Go over here. So that's what I think about that. Thank you so much, Sandy. This is labeled the best question. <laughs> wow. I find that if I don't plan my business and personal life, i.e. goals, schedule time, I don't get much done. These seem to me to clearly be acts of will. On the other hand, I say the third step prayer every day. How do I reconcile these two seemingly contradictory desires? I find that if I don't plan my... Um, I think that making a decision to turn my will and my life over to care of God as I understand him so that uh, my difficulties can serve as a, and my victory over my difficulties or my ability to handle them in concert with my relationship with God can serve as a demonstration for new people. Uh, I think that idea um, has absolutely no friction and no disagreement with the notion that I should know what the hell I'm doing, going to do before 12 o'clock tonight. Um, it's, it makes great good sense. You know, what our, our book suggests is make as many plans as you want, but do not live in them. If you live in them, you're going to be in big, big trouble uh, because you can't live in today when you're living in them. And if you can't live in today, then you're not living in the only moment that's available to you. There's nothing else available to you. Everything else is just an idea. And ideas, like my feelings, are greatly overrated. Um, so I, uh, um, and by the way, I'm not trying to diminish my feelings, but they are overrated because they're so mercurial. They just change too much for me to, to take them that seriously at any given time. Um, uh, so, uh, I see no friction between these two at all. I, I think that it's a, a great thing for a newcomer to see, that uh, to have a robust experience of step three. You know, I take step three, and I say, Pop, I'm yours. And he says, well, yeah, I knew that. I'm God. I had a strong feeling that that was true. And, uh, but it's a very nice gesture, and I really appreciate it. What the hell are you talking about? And I go, well, this is what I mean. This is, these resentments, these fears, this sexual misconduct, these difficulties, these problems, this past, this future. Can you help me? Oh, yeah, no, I can do something about that. We can have a relationship. I can do your work. You can do my work. We can find different ways of doing stuff together. And, uh, but it's going to have little permanent or lasting effect unless you really kind of get to work here and get the rubber to the road and start doing some stuff. That change thing again. All this is very nice to think about and write about and stuff, but if I'm not using it as a, a lever for change, it's a pretty worthless endeavor. So that being said, uh, making that decision, that gorgeous decision, and I, I, you know, when people say that step three is just a decision, um, that's not the way I experience it. I experience it as a decision, as an action, as a living, breathing part of my life, as something I can demonstrate all the time, as, as something that's... Uh, if I take a look at the third step prayer as a, a wonderful, intrinsic part of my life, a, a great source of joy and of uh, fact-finding and fact-facing. So um, I see no problem between those two. It makes very good sense to me that I would do both. Thanks, buddy. 
We're getting near the end of the time. I think we'll do, um, maybe I'm just tired. Um, yeah, I don't think we can get to all of them. Why don't, why don't we take two more each? Oh, we just did the best one, so I don't know. What oh, all right. Do. We'll do two more each, and then um, the rest, as I say, if you wrote one that didn't get answered and you want a written answer, I'll be glad to get it there. So here we go. How does one survive in the business life, corporate America, by practicing the principles in all our affairs? Well, I'm going to. I'm going to say that um, business. That what makes business go? Money. I mean, that's anybody in business knows that money is the deal. And I don't know if you've noticed, but. Money has a warning label on it. Did you know that? It says, in God we trust. It's trying to warn you, don't trust money to make you happy. In God we trust. So, success in business, if it's supposed to produce happiness is a joke. That's what I, the point that is so missing. If I succeed, if this advances, I will get money and happiness. And so what Chuck was trying to say, and he, of course he didn't really go into details about how he went back and practiced business spiritually, but he was talking about near the end the bid and, the, and that they weren't letting other people bid against Chuck. Chuck was in the um, supermarket layout, install the freezers and the counters and the layout, etc. business. And um, he would talk to the customer and say, Whatever you want is going to get done, and you're going to be happy with it. So they would agree upon a price or whatever it was, and then they'd start. And then at some point, maybe the uh, guy would say, well, actually, I really wanted the freezers on this side. Well, when you do that late in the um, process, it can't be done for the original agreed-upon amount. And so Chuck would say, Don't worry, I'll move them over there at my expense. Because I just want you to be happy with them. And the people, now that takes a big leap of faith. You're out of business. You can't just voluntarily decide to take a loss. Nobody would let them do it. The offer itself was so overpowering. (laughs) That they would go, no, 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 you move it, but you have to give me the cost on moving it. And in other words, they just knew all he wanted to do was use his skills to make them happy. Now that takes a big leap of faith to realize that making someone else happy is the only reason that you are doing whatever you're doing. Um... When I was interviewing for a job and I desperately needed with six kids, and God, we were broke. Even though I'd been sober a number of years, I had a hard time making money. And I'm interviewing for a a job that uh, Marine General's the head of the place and the Marine Colonel is the general counsel, and I'm interviewing in the general counsel's office. And we get through talking and he and I really wasn't didn't have the qualifications they really needed and he said by the way why'd you leave the Marine Corps and I went she so I said well I was thrown out for drinking but I've been in AA for 10 years and I really know that I could learn how to do this job and he said okay well we'll let you know and about three weeks later the personnel office called and said if you want the job it's yours 
And uh, I did a great job. Somehow I just knew how to do it. And years later, we were friends. And he said, you ever wonder why I hired you? And I said, yeah, I often did wonder why you hired me. (laughs) And he said, I just wonder what it would be like to work with someone that honest. So we can't believe that these spiritual principles could possibly work in the business world. You can't. You can't lay it out in a business manual. So what did Chuck say to do? Let's pretend they work and do them. Let's pretend they work and do them. And that's what he did. So that's the only... I know it sounds vague. It almost sounds like a cop-out. But I really believe that's the answer. All right, you got one. What do you got? Thanks for a great answer. That didn't sound vague to me, buddy. I'll tell you that. All right. How do you silence your mind? Um, sometimes from practice and meditation, I'm able to silence my mind, and sometimes I can't. So what I do, try to do is I try to pull back from the stream and watch it. So, um, And one of my teachers suggests doing this thing, which is a gorgeous thing. So sometimes I meditate, and I can go to a quiet place. I do different exercises to try to get quiet. And sometimes I just live in a psychological theme park, and I'm not going to get quiet. It ain't, it's just, it ain't going to happen, babe, you know. It's just not going to happen. And um, uh, incoming, incoming. And um, uh, uh, so um, sometimes I can attain that quietness. And when I can't, I try to rip the Velcro off, step back, and just watch the stream and be, be the watcher. And when I'm able to do that, it's a great feeling and, um, and one of my teachers suggests <laughs> saying, hmm, thinking. And she says, touch the thought like a feather on a bubble and bless the thought and go back to being quiet. And then when the next thought comes up or the next noise, go, hmm, thinking. <laughs> and bless the thought and touch it as lightly as you can, like a feather on a bubble, and go back to that place. It's really very lovely. Also, the thing that uh, guys I sponsor and I have been working on over a period of time is there's a very nice idea in our book. It says uh, in step 11, all through the day, we uh, stop and take a breath and ask for an intuitive thought. It's a very nice idea. To actually do it is a whole other thing. And to have a practice where you can go, hmm, thinking. And take a moment and actually be refreshed and not just remember, oh, I should be stopping during the day and getting refreshed. Um, But to really have a practice where you have a way to do that, again, that's rubber on the road. That's, That's really seeing your practice in action. Thanks, Scott. Is that good hype for you? My name's Stephen. I'm an alcoholic. I couldn't help but think we already heard the three tenors today with uh, Sandy and Scott and Chuck C. So uh, we've been to the mountaintop and get down to sea level now because you're going to get the neurotic Jew from the streets of Beverly Hills. (laughs) And that's the truth. But it is my story, and it does say somewhere that it's uh, our most valuable asset. And and from where, you know, I got to AA, it zeroed out. There was absolutely, I was living a life that was no longer defensible even to myself. I mean, there was absolutely nothing working. Uh, And it's completely different today, and the... The only thing that's intervened between the day I got sober, August 10th, 1980, and today is Alcoholics Anonymous and a, and a constant surrender and a submission and they're asking for help. And my life is the opposite of what it was then. I was appealed zero when I got here, and it's filled. It's filled with, with um, friends. I was emptied out. I did not go the... I didn't answer the phone. The drapes were drawn. I didn't go to the mailbox. I was sitting in a yellow rocking chair for the last three years, drinking cheap scotch and thinking about me. And uh, that kept me very busy. Um, (laughs) 
So I'm going to tell you my story um, in chronological order. I'm the youngest of three kids, a native Californian. My mother married uh, this man in those days. You got married to get out of the house. Uh, Love was not often involved. It wasn't involved in that particular relationship. He was attractive, and she didn't get along with her mother, and they got married. And the first piece of furniture they bought for the house he bought was a bar. (laughs) Now, that's not one of the 20 questions, but it could be. You know, if you bought a bar before you bought your children a bed, go to AA now. (laughs) And that was my dad. And and they were married until I was about four years old, and she met someone who was going to upgrade the family. And and it was going to be an upgrade. And they didn't sit the three little kids down and say, I'm divorcing this man, I'm going to marry this man. My family communicates in eye signals and hand signals, and and, uh, it was, shh, he's got money, camp, restaurants, shh, a lot of this. And she threw us, they threw us in the house, three kids, and he had three kids, and all of a sudden there's six of us, or eight eight of us in this little house, and and, uh, uh, the message that was communicated to me is... um, be quiet and calm down. Now, I got to tell you, I was not a calm kid. I was, uh, give you some of my outward symptoms. I was a fingernail biter, a bedwetter, a teeth grinder, a pencil eater, and a foot wiggler. Um, you know, you see that name. I've been watching Sandy. Whenever Sandy talks, he's a, a foot swinger. You know, if you want a name for that, it's called idling. Uh, and it, a lot of alcoholics idle there they're constantly. And that was me. You know, in first grade, I was the kid. They loved me. They just often put my desk in the hallway because um, I also had, was being given an upper GI for ulcers at the age of nine. So I was a nervous little guy. And if you see a kid like that, give him a drink, you know. <laughs> Here, little boy, have a beer. Have a case, you know, you need it. And I needed a drink. I needed a drink. I, and I didn't get a drink until I was 14. And, and it was a long 14 years of just wiggling and squirming and looking at you. And you look like you have the, you have the road map and I'm lost. You look comfortable and I'm uncomfortable. You look like you're having conversations with people and I'm tongue-tied. And I'm uncomfortable in my own skin. The only time as a kid I was comfortable was playing baseball just felt like I belonged on a baseball field. And I was really good up until the age of 12. I was the pitcher. I got all my self-esteem from being a little ball player. I was the pitcher and the shortstop. And everyone, oh, you're the great little ball player. And at the age of 13, you go up to Little League. And all of a sudden, they throw the ball faster. And all of a sudden, I got afraid of getting hit by the ball. And you can't hide the fear. I can hide the other fear. I can hide the fear of people by being funny or moving around or disappearing. But when the batter's afraid, you have to step towards the pitcher to hit the ball. And I'm stepping towards my mommy. And, and it's not macho. And rather than go to a coach and ask for help, I pick a fight with him and quit the team. I'm going to give up the thing I love the most rather than ask for help. And I brought that deep into sobriety. And I gave up. I quit the team and I gave it up right away. And at that same time, we were... We were um, living in, a, in this town. We were the only Jewish family in this town. I always felt too Jewish. I wanted to be just like the other kids and sing the Christmas carols. And then we moved to Beverly Hills where it's 90% Jewish. And, and my first day of school, I'm thinking, I'm just not Jewish enough to cut it in Beverly Hills. <laughs> they all seem so Jewish. You know? And they also seemed so disinterested in the newcomer in town. It just, they treated me disdainfully. They hardly even looked at me for weeks. I couldn't make a friend, and I hook up with this other guy who had just moved to town, Greg. And and so the two out-of-towners are hanging out, and one night he says, hey, there's a club up on Sunset Boulevard. You want to go? I said, okay. And we went up, we took the bus, we went in, and they were disinterested in both of us. and, And it was uncomfortable, and I didn't make a friend, and... And we gave up. I said, let's go, let's go. And a week later, he says, you want to go back? And I said, I don't think so. And he said, I have a quart of uh, Smirnoff. And I said, I'll be right down. And I, and I was growing up in a house without alcohol. But the father 
who my mother divorced, would have us every couple weeks, and he would have that bar with all the booze, and I was just drawn to it like a moth to a fly. I just fell in love with all the glasses and the bottles and the labels and stuff. So when Greg says Smirnoff vodka, I take the walk two blocks down to his house, and we pour the quart of Smirnoff and a quart of orange juice and stir it around, put a little Galliano on top, start drinking. And I sighed for the first time in 14 years. You know, I just went, oh. You know, that way you have a pain and all of a sudden you get so used to living with the pain that all of a sudden it's gone. You go, oh my God, this is wonderful. Oh, and we got on the bus. We took the bus again back up to the Sunset Strip. We were the only two people on the bus and lost each other on the way there. (laughs) And I walked into the club that night alone. And it seemed like, and Sandy tells the story when he, the first time he spoke and, and walking into Yale into that party, it felt this, that's, that's my story walking into the club that night. It seems like I walked in and they all turned around and were interested in me. And it changed my world. I made friends. Girls didn't scare me. I was a guy among guys. We were hanging out. And just, I abandoned myself to alcohol. It just became the most important thing in the world to me. And I didn't know it until I got sober. Every decision I was going to make socially and in my life was about getting enough supply of booze. Where are we going? Oh, okay, we're going to be at Nancy's house Friday night. I'm in charge of getting enough booze. You know, God forbid al on is ordering the booze. They, you know, it's a scary thought. They could run out and not even know it. God. So I would order. I'd call up the liquor store, Gil Turner's, 213-651-2000 is their number. <laughs> you bring it on, you know, bring it on. Come on, double. How much? We got 30 kids? Uh, uh, double. All right. And, and we didn't run out, and that was my whole thing. I don't want to run out. I'm not, I always got to get done. I just, I, I need to relax, and I can't relax unless we have a lot. And, and uh, so I drank my way through high school. I stopped doing well in school. Some people do really well in school. I didn't. I smoked a little pot in high school. I gave that up. I was really from, and I'll apologize right away. I'm a kid of the 60s, and I did very few drugs. I'm very sorry. I I, uh, I smoked a little pot, and my memories are, it's not good for paranoid people. You know, that's that was it. And also, it's like... Uh, don't look at me, give me your cheeseburger, you know, <laughs> or I'll kill you, something like that. Anyway, I go through high school, I'm the teenage drunk, I had alcohol poisoning at 16 years old from a, drinking a quart of scotch and mixing it with water, and I remember solemn oath, and I couldn't stop vomiting liver bile and just going, never, never, I will never, ever do this again, please God help me, and the family doctor, and by five o'clock the next day going... I think you shouldn't put water in scotch. The water really makes you sick. And I drank the ne- and I drank the next day, you know, because anything to make me sigh or give me relief, I'm going to do it. And I drank my way. I graduated high school in the lower sixth of my graduating class. I was sent to a. Uh... <laughs> it's not that funny. <laughs> It was a college. They're still there. It was the, it was the last year it was an all guy college up in San Francisco, and it was small classes. And it was an opportunity for kids to get back on track who screwed around in high school. And I was sent there. It was 400 students and 12, 12 kids and, and wonderful professors. And, and they had uh, put me in trailers behind the campus. They seemed to have pre qualified all the alcoholics. and. And uh, they had a like a big five-gallon uh, water thing in the dorm room, and we immediately emptied out the water, went to the liquor store across the street and got five gallons of vodka, and it's like, I'm ready for school. And, and drinking and drinking, now it's not the weekends. It's, it's I can drink and I can calm down. The other thing that happened is my, my buddy Joey went up there, and Joey was a hyperactive kid like I was, but his parents had taken to him to a psychiatrist who prescribed this pill that was supposed to calm him down, called Dexamil. And Dexamil is, um, well, it's magnificent. And Joey acted calm enough to keep the supply going. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> Dexamil increases your vocabulary by 36,000 words. Um, and you use them all like the first 10 minutes. So he, he, 
And if you're a smoker, you don't need matches because you're ne absolutely never without a cigarette. You're just lighting one. And that, I realized my potential, and, and that became uh, an obsession for the next 10 years. I was a little speed freak, scotch drinking, vodka drinking student. And, but when I'm not, when I don't have something in me, I'm restless, I'm irritable, I'm discontent. It doesn't feel right. I'm, I'm ill at ease. And, and I blame people, places, and things for my internal world. It's, it's you, the campus is too small, there's no girls here. I need to get out of here. If I get, if I go somewhere else, then I'll be, I'll fit somewhere else. I just don't fit here. And I fantasize. I'm a wonderful world-class fantasizer. In those days, they didn't have computers, but they had college catalogs. I would go in the library, and I'd pull it off the shelf. Maybe I should go to Maine. Maybe I should drink Mai Tais in Hawaii. And I stumble across a college, and it's on a ship, and it travels around the world. And I thought, there's my school. Did a little research. I heard 300 girls and 100 guys, and I thought even a shy kid could get laid on this trip. And, and, and I apply, and they took me. It's not, it's not Harvard Medical School. If you apply, you get taken. And, and, uh, and I called home. I said, can I go? And my mom said, yeah, you can go. And, and I realized now what a privilege it, it was to be able to do something like that. And, and I wish I remembered it, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> All the kids, we, we sailed from New York to London, and everyone went off to museums, and I found Peter, and we drank at the pub in the harbor. I mean, and then it was just, how do we smuggle on enough booze? Because we're going to Amsterdam. He goes, you know, and get it in the cabin to get the booze, to get the courage in me to leave my cabin, to go out and do what other students seem to be doing naturally. I can't function around people unless there's alcohol in me. I cannot. I'm too uptight. And I drank my way around the world. I have a lot of pictures and no memories. Uh, and fortunately, my parents had never been there, so I could do a slideshow and just make up stuff when I came back to make them feel fulfilled. And came back and went to a four-year college. I graduated college in four years. I went to USC only because I didn't know you could make it last for 10 till I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I hear people here, yeah, I was in college for 20 years. And I always go, what was my hurry? You know, I was in no hurry at all. And, and when you're a senior in college, you're, people start looking. Well, my stepfather mainly was looking at me like, move out. <laughs> Get a job. Do something. Go away. They were very tired of all these six kids, and I was the last remnant there. So I applied to law school because I didn't want to get a job. And all of a sudden, I apply to one law school, and they take me. And I'm like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. Because my dirty little secret is I'm not very smart, and I don't have what it takes. And all of a sudden, I'm in law school, and I'm sitting, and I'm always, I am the best student for the first two weeks of a semester. I am the outlining, a yellow, green, little notes, everything's readable. And the first day of class, I remember it was a contracts class, and it was a case, Hamer versus Sidway, a contracts case, uh, consideration, and I'm prepared, and he calls my name Abrams, alphabetically I'm screwed, you know, and, and, uh, and he tries to have this Socratic method with me where he's trying to draw out the issues of the case, and I'm standing up in front of 150 students, and I have a panic attack in front of the class. And if you've never had a panic attack, they're really just wimpy. I mean, I think only women should have them, but you're sweating, your heart's pounding, your brain's whirring, your, your mouth is dry, and he's trying to engage me in a little conversation. I'm being publicly humiliated. And I didn't know till years later that what he got, until I wrote an inventory, that who he got that day was the 12-year-old kid in the batter's box. That's what he got. Because every time I had an emotion, I poured alcohol on top of it. I never went and got help. And the very first day of, the, of law school, I'm being embarrassed in front of everyone. And once again, rather than go to the professor after class and ask for help, I, now I go to the bar and pour alcohol on top of it because alcohol will get rid of it. And I spent two years in law school just hiding and laying low and moving along. And I had five amphetamine doctors, so I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle of class. I'm a little edgy, but I'm, I'm motivated, you know. <laughs> speed is, um, 
it's okay unless a bird shadow flies over you. And you absolutely can come out of your skin. What was that? So I was a little jumpy. And I go through two years of law school. And I'm like, I'm screwed. People think I'm going to be a lawyer. And I'm not. They're not smart enough to pass the bar. And I don't really want to be a lawyer. And they think I do. And all of a sudden, it was like an angel flew into my life. And this guy appears and says, you know, I have this business in Chicago. And my son died. And you're the one I'd like to turn it over to. And if you come and work for me, you'll be a millionaire by the time you're 30. And I'll give you a new Corvette. I'm like, okay, I'm there. I'm taking a leave of absence from law school, and off I go to Chicago. And and I I entered the second phase of my alcoholism. It was the fun phase, and it was taking away the fear in the early days, and I went there, and sometimes it would do that, and sometimes it wouldn't. And sometimes it would be a stimulant, and sometimes I'd get depressed. And I was afraid of customers, and he didn't, he didn't, he had mentioned that I drank, and he didn't want me breathing on the customers. So I was hiding from the customers. I didn't sell a car in like two months and I got arrested for drunk driving and it started to fall off the edge of the earth. And and the other significant thing that happened to me there is uh, one drunken night we were talking and and, uh, he had said to me, you know, your mother and I were very close about nine months before you were born. And I took that information like I take information. I don't go and say help or talk to me or whatever. I pour alcohol on top of it. And I was to, I came back to LA the day of my drunk driving trial, re-enrolled in law school and tried to finish law school and, and didn't. I mean, I would, at this point, my drinking had gotten to the point where I was, um, I had a bottle between my legs driving down Wilshire Boulevard to go to, to go to school and, uh, and would pull into the parking lot and I'd get another drink to get the courage to leave the car, to go in the class, to sit there. And I got within two classes of graduating law school and didn't show up for an exam and they flunked me out. I had already been fingerprinted to take the bar and measured for cap and gown for the graduation service. And, and, um, and at this time, my family was... Um, my stepfather was the, was the patriarch and the glue that held us together. And, and my brother was, at, at that time, in the midst of what was about a 20-year heroin run. And my mom, who did, really didn't drink until I was in high school, was drinking. And that stepfather went off one night to uh, play racquetball and had a heart attack and dropped dead. And the family just fell apart. And now I'm back from Chicago, and I'm drinking alcoholically, and my mom's drinking a... a half gallon of vodka a day, and the brothers burglarizing the house on a regular basis. And it was uh, all the fun and laughter that that man had brought to the family was now gone. And as long as I was in law school, too, the heat was off. Law school will keep people back from you. You, You're a loser, you're selfish, you're an asshole, but you're going to be a lawyer. When you flunk out of law school, you're not going to be a lawyer anymore. You're the guy who flunked out of law school, and your covers are pulled. And my mom had felt guilty, and she was throwing money at us kids. And and so I was living in this nice apartment and and dying of alcoholism and and cutting things off and not going to the mailbox. And, And I finally had a girlfriend leave me and say, you drink too much. Now I have the drunk driving, the guy in Chicago, the girlfriend's leaving. I said, oh, you know what, I'll go to AA. And I, and I called and I went over to uh, a meeting house about two blocks from where I live. And I sat against the wall and felt like the biggest loser you could possibly be in the whole world. I wanted to be like my stepfather told me. I wanted to have the willpower to have two or three drinks and just quit. And I wasn't done. And the speaker said something. He drank mouthwash because he was out of booze for the alcohol. And I thought, well, if I ever drink scope, I'll come back to you guys. You know, I'm a scotch drinker, not a scope drinker. Uh, And those last, I really sat in that yellow rocking chair just dying, just thinking somewhere along the line I have to figure it out, that I have to think my way into sobriety. And how I finally got sober was a buddy fixed me up on a date with a girl. It was a weird thing. It was totally a god shot for me because let's just say I wasn't a good catch. (laughs) Without getting too specific. (laughs) And I said yes to go out with this girl and she was 
cute and adorable and, and uh, successful, which meant I can't ask her out again because she writes, she composes music for film and television. What, what if she says, what do you do? <laughs> I drink. That's it? No, I watch Jeopardy. I drink, I watch Jeopardy. That's, that's it? I think about myself a lot, you know. <laughs> How's your score coming, you know? And um, so I didn't ask her out for a couple of weeks, but apparently I called her in a blackout. And I told her stuff that I'd hidden from, from everyone who cared about me, you know, about my drinking, and then I was dying of, of I can't, I won't have a life as long as I drink, and, and, uh, and she said, well, I'm in OA, and if you'd like, I'll take you to an AA meeting. And I said, okay. And, and uh, she called me the next day thinking I may unsurrender myself. And, and uh, she took me to uh, Sunday noon, Ohio Street, August 10th, 1980. And I walked in there, and I sat in the front and, and melted. Um, the biggest charge then, it's, it's, it's really the same charge today, is you talked and I went me too. I did that. I'm like you. You drank worse than me, not as bad as me. You took more pills than me, a little less than me. And you were clearly happy about being sober. It just melted me. And especially talking about the feelings, the feelings better than and less than simultaneously. Feeling separated by a pane of glass from everyone else. Wanting this self-consciousness, this self-obsession. I was just me too, me too. This is my tribe and I belong here. And, um, and I took the first half of the first step that night. I am power. I have been trying to control and enjoy my drinking now for five years. And every day I just kind of poop out and lose interest in the project. Oh, alcohol's the problem. I just won't drink. And the obsession was taken away, and my, then my life will get manageable. And I did not 12-step my mother, but she followed me in here. She was, um, and, and got in the Pacific group, and she got a sponsor, and one of the first things her sponsor told her was to stop giving me money. So I thought, well, <laughs> sponsors really get involved in shit that's none of their goddamn business. <laughs> the hell's that got to do with me drinking, you know? I was just starved to death. And I had this little obsession with this woman, you know, and I thought I would go into enough meetings to know that sometimes sponsors intervene in stuff like that, and I didn't want anyone intervening with this sober sex I was having. And so I went a long time without a home group, a sponsor, or working a step, and I got the results of no recovery, and um, on my second, that girl got pregnant, by the way, and we didn't get along when we were in a vertical po position at all. You know, it was one of those, uh, I hate your guts, lie down, I love you relationships, and, and uh, she got pregnant, and on my second AA birthday, we went to Cedar sinai and my son Max was born, and we weren't going to get married, and we hardly talked, and her family was very angry with me. And I was scared to death, and I was probably as close to drinking as, as I, I hope I ever get. And I, wa and I wasn't even thinking of drinking, but I had that knot in my chest that only scotch dissolves, you know. And, uh, and they were angry with me, and I understand. And, and, um, and I was scared to death. I was, I, I was hardly working. Let's just say I had an indoor job and I had a good tan. Um, It was a scary time, and, and uh, her parents came to town, and they, were, they didn't want me to take the baby outside because he hadn't been baptized, that he could end up in limbo for a billion years or something. Didn't they just do away with that? Well, in 1982, limbo was going strong, trust me. So I wanted to get Max Abrams out of the house, you know, to get him a little fresh air, and I'm telling him, and the local priest wouldn't do it. Because our relationship was unresolved. And, and I was telling my mom this story, and she's like, you're going to drink, you're going to drink, you need to go to meetings. I said, I need to baptize this kid. And she's like, oh, it's so funny. I heard this Catholic priest last night at a meeting. Let me give his number, and you can call him and maybe manipulate him into doing it. And, uh, and great, the Jews are on the case. We're, we're good at this shit. So I, went, I go, I call this guy up. Oh, yeah, you're an alcoholic? Yeah, I am. He says, well, meet me at a meeting and we'll talk after. It's always the same with this guy. Let's go to a meeting first and we'll talk after. 
And they had moved the meeting outside and into a courtyard, and there was just a light on, on him. And I thought, oh, I could relax in this meeting. They won't call on me. I could just sit here. And he shared in a Buddhist expression, you know, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. And it was the most important night, I think, of my whole life. Cause I, and I always get tears when I talk about it. Because I walked up and said, help. Help. I'm lost. My life is clearly unmanageable. I need direction. I need help. I need a sponsor. And he's been my sponsor now for 25 years and is absolutely the most important relationship in my life. I was thinking today we were talking about fathers. or Fathers came up a lot tonight. It was tonight I was thinking about it. All my life I had that... The first father who was embarrassed that he was an alcoholic and the stepfather who, who always said in my house that, that blood is thicker than water and I knew what that meant. And then I had the guy in Chicago who told me he's probably my father and I was to find out that he was my father years later. And then I had this priest, Father Terry, as my sponsor. And ultimately we talk today. It's our father. You know, it's been this search my whole life for the father. And that's the father. You know, that's, that's the path I've been on. And that's what Terry's always, uh, my sponsor's always telling me. You know, the good sponsor, do the work. There's your answer. Do the work. But that's the answer. And uh, so the last 25 years has been a slow walk to the center of the program. Uh, a slow walk to the center of the program. I have had this uh, exquisite life exquisite. The, uh, it was very hard for me to make friends and be around people for many years in sobriety. I got the not drinking part. I just couldn't be comfortable around people, even in AA and meetings. Uh, and it's been a slow journey to, to, um, to relax here. And the fellowship has grown up around me. Boy, I got the most wonderful people in my life. Uh, uh, just extraordinary. I um, I was uh, hopeless when I got here. You know, I think I was in good shape. I had very low expectations, uh, and, and it served me well. Uh, my life is is absolutely huge today, and and uh, and I want it all. I want it big. I want the big horizon. It seems to me the image I get of me without. Um, AA, is Steve's normal position is this. With my chin on my chest and thinking about me, you know, and worrying about me and what's going to go wrong in my life and where the snake is going to come out of the bushes and bite my leg. What psychiatrist once told me, you have the worst case of catastrophic thinking I've ever seen in my 32 years of practice. I thought, can I turn this into a business, you know, where someone could call me and go, Exxon and Texaco are going to merge. What's the bad things that could happen, Steve? And I go, oh, boom, 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 you know. So that's, so that's me in my normal state, self-obsessed and fearful and worried. And the more I surrender to you and God and hang around with you, that the program seems to lift my chin up to the horizon to show me what my higher power has been sending me all along, and I'm missing because I'm in the bondage of self. So to slowly uncover, discover, and discard, uncover, discover, and discard. I'm a work in progress, but it's the best it's ever been. I just love AA. Thanks. Steve, thank you. Steve and I have something in common. We went to lunch with Clancy at the mission. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything except when we finished, we both looked at each other and said, I'm going to pretend I never saw that. <laughs> anyway. Um, that was just wonderful. And now I get the pleasure of introducing another great man from Hagerstown, Maryland, Jack Cordman. Come on up, Jack. Thank 
Thank you, Sandy. Uh, my name is Jack, and I am an alcoholic. What a uh, privilege it is to attend this uh, weekend, and what an honor it is to be asked to participate in it. And uh, I really do. I have to. I think. I think I do, and I think all of us do. Have to thank God for allowing uh, Sandy to be open uh, to an intuitive thought to do something like this, and uh, to Sandy to be willing to. Uh, organize it. And uh, I want to thank uh, folks who I'd never really met before, uh, Amy and uh, and Guy and uh, Chris, and uh, now I had met Dave before, who have been willing to suit up and show up and do the grunt work, uh, because this stuff just doesn't happen. I just can't imagine the registration involved with dealing with all these egos who, you know, want it just so. And um, what a miracle! I want to thank uh, want to thank Scott and uh, and Steve for for participating. Uh, and uh, what a treat it was to to see that tape with uh, with uh, Chuck. And then for all you guys who uh, shared around the uh, fire ring tonight and. Uh, I just can't imagine what was going through your minds as Dave would go over and put another log on it and the sparks would blow your way and you said, that son of a bitch is going to put another log on the fire. <laughs> <coughs> but Dave's got nothing to do with the way the wind blows. So uh, Now there were a couple of us who were not as sick as others and they got up and moved. And that uh, some of us sat with our backs to the prevailing wind and that seemed to work well. Um, I'm from I'm from Hagerstown, Maryland. Um, I uh, am a member of the cleverly named Hagerstown Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, we are the third oldest group in the state of Maryland. I'm not sure about this, but I think I can probably say this without fear of contradiction. Uh, the Hagerstown Group uh, has four members here at this weekend. So we may be the most well-represented group, at least outside of the Tampa area. Uh, We meet on Mondays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, and uh, if we were in Hagerstown, we would be at our home group tonight, because that's what we do when we're in Hagerstown. And I like to say that I am a uh, member in good standing of that group. Uh, By that I mean I have a sponsor. Um, My sponsor has a sponsor. I sponsor people, Uh, I attend my home group when they meet, if I'm in town, I have a service position, and I think all of that is real important to be a member in good standing in Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't always that way uh, for me. Um, This is a pretty unique weekend and a pretty interesting gathering of people. If I might inquire... Uh, the number of folks who are here by a show of hands who are in your first year of sobriety. First year. We got two. Okay. Uh, been an interesting year, hadn't it? Yeah. Well, it'll get better. <laughs> I think that uh, being with so many people who have got more than a year's sobriety is can be daunting. Uh, because... Um, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And uh, I was thinking, uh, well, actually, I wasn't thinking because that scares my sponsor, but I was reflecting uh, about what an exciting week it is for us. Um, just this past Tuesday, uh, December 11th, 1934, Bill took his last drink, and my life was saved. Imagine that. An event that took place long before I was born, destined to save my life. And it almost passed without my noticing it. And maybe it passed without your noticing it. It's something, there's just something absolutely miraculous about the history and lore of Alcoholics Anonymous that just touches my heart. I don't know about yours, but my mom's 92 years old and she lives on her own and 
She was married to my alcoholic father for 30 years, and she knows what an alcoholic is. And when I, uh, when I told her that I was coming down here for this weekend, she said, are, are you going to be speaking down there? And I said, I may. And she said, well, if you speak down there, you make sure that you tell those people that you are not an alcoholic. So I've told you. Uh, you know, like I said, my mom was married to that uh, my alcoholic father for 30 years, and she knows what an alcoholic is. And I just think, what would have happened? What would I have? What would have happened at any time in my mom's life if she'd have gotten a telephone call on a Saturday before Mother's Day, and the guy on the phone said, "Hey, I'm a rummy from New York, and I'm looking for a drunk to work with. Can you help me?" My mother would have hung up. She wouldn't have taken that call. And here is Henrietta Cyberly living in that gatehouse separated from her husband. What a, what a disgrace. What a shameful thing in 1935. Separated from her husband, living on the property of her in-laws in the gatehouse. And Henrietta had prayed for her friend, Dr. Bob, and she had prayed that God would send somebody to help her friend. Please, God, send somebody to help Dr. Bob. So she was expectant. She was expectant that her prayer would be answered. And so when the phone rang and the guy says, I'm a rummy from New York, she said, come on out. Come on out. Can you imagine the social stigma for a separated woman in 1935 to have a rummy from New York come visit in her house to be a guest with she and her children? Disgraceful. She didn't hesitate. And, of course, we all know that Bob came uh, on Mother's Day and going to stay 15 minutes, no longer. That's it. And five and a half hours later, you know, the spark had been struck. Now, Dr. Bob, uh, like me, really wasn't interested in the program of action that had been offered to him by Bill. Uh, seemed pretty, uh, pretty demanding. Required a lot of things Dr. Bob didn't think were going to work, but uh, obviously this guy seemed to know what he was talking about, so let's hang out together and live on fear and fellowship and see how that works out. And so they did. And like happens to so many of us, sometimes we get a little bit sober, we want to start working out at the gym, maybe go back to school. Dr. Bob had to go to a medical association meeting all of a sudden, and so off he went, you know, and he got snot flying drunk and They poured him off the train, and Bill went and got him and tried to sober him up. And Dr. Bob's a medical man, you know, and I'm sure most of you know, but in case you don't know, he was a specialist. And um, I don't know what proctology is today, what it was then, but I think proctology is pretty much the same. You just deal with a lot of assholes and... uh, Dr. Bob had one to deal with, and uh, he had to do the operation. He had to do the operation. I mean, I think, I guess he'd probably been paid in advance. I don't know. So they drove him down to the hospital and gave him a beer to steady his hand. I wonder what that guy's name was. Did you ever think about that? You know, it's... His name's been lost to AA history, and he he offered himself up as a human sacrifice. (laughs) Proctologist with a shaking hand. Makes me nervous. I don't know about you. And Dr. Bob never drank again. Never drank again. And ten, you know, just was it, uh, what was that, June 10th, I think it was? And then uh, we read in our literature, this guy, uh, Bill D., he's uh, June 26th, he's in the hospital, and these guys come see him. I mean, that's like 16 days. So uh, how long do you have to be in Alcoholics Anonymous before you start sponsoring people? Sounds like 16 days. It's in the book. You know, I mean, Bill was out there pulling guys off bar stools from December 11th to to Mother's Day and hadn't worked for anybody, but he stayed sober. Intensive work with other alcoholics, I think, I think is what is being offered here. But um, just amazing when I, when I reflect upon it. Sandy, uh, Sandy said that I had time uh, 
I forget how much time he said, but it was two, two and a half hours, so he said we'll finish late, so whatever it is. But he said I could talk about my favorite subject, and uh, I was going to talk about S- Steve, but, but he already talked about him, so I'm going to talk about me. Surprised, aren't you? <laughs> I may not be much, but I'm all I think about, and uh, I think about me a lot, at least I did before... Uh, where I started taking action on this program. Um, I think alcohol did for me certainly what it did for Steve. I'm sure it probably did for me what it did for you. Uh, I mean, for people who don't have this problem, you know, they drink, they get drunk, they make an ass out of themselves, they get in a fight, they get shit beat out of them, they get up the next morning, and they don't do that again. I understand that for many of us, that's a definition of fun. And uh, I didn't get in a lot of fights. I could start a lot of fights because I had bigger guys with me who were good at fighting, but I was just good at starting fights. So I didn't get beat up. But, um, and then, of course, part of that was I would worked as a police officer, so I had a gun, and that generally discourages <laughs> a lot of fighting. But... Uh, it was when I was a police officer that I found out that, uh, I mean, I'm a college, I was a college kid, and I mean, I, like most college kids, I think I had no idea what I wanted to do uh, when college was over. I was, I was majoring in drinking pretty much, uh, and uh, working as a cop, and I stopped this guy for drunk driving, and I gave him a ticket. Uh, he was obviously drunk. He said, you don't know who I am, do you? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, I'm the state's attorney for Worcester County, the county you're standing in right now. Like I said, I'm a college kid. I don't have the slightest idea what a state's attorney does. Never heard of one, never saw one, don't know what they do. So I said, good for you. Sign the ticket. And uh, he did, and there was a sober guy there, and I let him drive away. And into my shift, I pulled into the parking lot at the police department and 8 o'clock in the morning there was a chief of police he said uh, he said come up to my office and bring that uniform citation book with you these are the first words the chief had spoken to me the whole summer I thought this is a good thing that's going to happen here this is going to get some recognition long overdue recognition for a job well done and I went up there and you know, and uh, walked into the office, and much to my surprise, when I walked into the chief's office, there, seated on the couch right inside the door, was the guy I gave the ticket to at 3 o'clock in the morning. And they said, give me that ticket book. And I handed the ticket book to him, and he opened it up to the ticket to the for the guy and handed it to the guy, and that guy pulls out a pen and writes across the face of the ticket, Case Dismissed. And signs his name. And it was at that moment that I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. And if I could be one of those state's attorneys, I mean, I definitely wanted to be one of them. Because if you can dismiss traffic charges with a stroke of a pen, if you drank and drove like I drank and drove, come in real handy. So I went to law school. And uh, I met my wife while I was in college, where I met the girl that I was going to marry. And... Uh, she and I, um, we went out on a blind date and fraternity party, and she drank with me drink for drink. I mean to tell you, we had a wonderful time. And I took her back to her sorority, and she went in, and I realized that this is the first woman I've ever dated who did not throw up in my car. <laughs> I'm going to marry this girl. And so when I was in law school, we got married. And, uh, and we had a wonderful time drinking together. And then we started having children. And when she got pregnant, she quit drinking. And she hasn't drank since. What the hell is that all about? Lost my drinking buddy. When, when I was drinking... My wife and I were separated on uh, three separate occasions, and there were women involved. 
And then uh, after I stopped drinking, we were separated on three separate occasions, and there were women involved. And I think that's a pretty clear indication that drinking has nothing to do with any of those six separations. But alcoholism had everything to do with all six of them, and we didn't know. So I got out of law school, and I went back to Hagerstown, and I became a deputy state's attorney, and then I had a chance to become state's attorney, but the local senator screwed it up, and so we were, some of us were having some drinks, and we said, somebody ought to do something to that state senator. He shouldn't be allowed to get away with it, and somebody ought to run for the state senate, so I ran for the state senate, and the senator ran off with the secretary from the appropriations committee and abandoned his wife and children, and I got elected to the state senate, and when you get elected to the Senate in Maryland, they give you a license plate that says state senator, and that's an aid to efficient law enforcement because that way they don't have to pull you over, at least back then. They would just turn those overheads off once they got close enough to see that license plate, and they'd pull up alongside you on the interstate, and they'd turn that interior dome light on, and they'd toot the horn, beep, beep, hi, senator, hi, trooper. Hold it down, Senator. Okay, Trooper. And that way, you know, I could go on my way without being interfered with, and they didn't have to waste a lot of time with members of the General Assembly. So, you know, we got a situation in our town where we had a vacancy on the circuit court, general jurisdiction trial judge, and I went to see the governor about getting my friend appointed, and he said he wouldn't appoint him, but it's a 15-year term, and we only had two judges, and so it doesn't come around that very often. And He said he wouldn't appoint my friend, but if I wanted to be a circuit court judge, he'd appoint me circuit court judge. So I became a circuit court judge. That was uh, 30 years ago. And uh, drinking alcoholically. And uh, not knowing that there's a problem, because I've not been arrested. I've never been arrested, never lost a job, you know. Never been to jail, never been to prison. Never been divorced, don't have any illegitimate children, kids born out of wedlock. I, I don't even have a good tattoo. It's obvious I'm not alcoholic. And uh, I got real sick one year, April 7, 1982, and uh, I was in the hospital for seven weeks, and uh, they said I was going to die, but I didn't. And so, uh, you know, my, uh, my kidneys had quit, and my liver was out of whack, and my uh, pancreas was digesting itself, and my respiratory system quit, but I was hanging in there. And uh, eventually uh, my kidneys started. I got off the respirator and then I got off the dialysis stuff and my liver came back and pancreas started, uh, you know, stopped digesting itself. So they said they'd send me home. And when you're in the hospital for like seven weeks like that, they ask you, well, they talk to you about what not to do so you don't get it again. But my, my illness was undiagnosed, so I don't know what to tell you. But they did say that they didn't want me to drink. And I said, well, how long? And they said, uh, a year. And I was getting, it was May 28th. And I said, well... I haven't had anything to drink since April the 7th. This is the 28th of May. I think I can do that. Okay. And they said, no, Judge, you don't understand. You're very fine doctors at Johns Hopkins. They said, you don't understand. It's Memorial Day weekend. We want you to not drink from June the 1st. Now, I know that there are people in this room already who are discerning the injustice that these doctors were trying to foist upon me. Because I was getting no credit for my seven weeks of continuous sobriety. <laughs> and I want you to know that I fought for those seven weeks, and an argument broke out between those learned physicians and this knuckleheaded judge. 
and uh, we reached a compromise. And the compromise was that um, I wouldn't drink till next April the 7th. And then if I thought that the pain and suffering and misery which I had just endured had anything to do with drinking, then I had not drank till June the 1st. It was up to me. And so I walked out of Johns Hopkins Hospital not drinking. Nobody said anything about alcoholism. They said, don't drink. Give your kidneys a rest. Allow your liver to recover, your pancreas. Alcohol just knocks the heck out of those things. You know, don't drink. Love life. Have a good time. Well, I now know, and I think a lot of you know, if not all of us know, that uh, when separated from alcohol, the doctor says, in his opinion, that we become restless, irritable, and discontent. That's an understatement in my case. I was pissed off in a spring-looted position is what I was. And uh, I'd be happy to share that with you if you happen to step in front of me. Or happen to have your DWI case uh, on Monday morning. But... <laughs> so... Uh, there it is. I'm uh, not drinking and not changing and just praise her in a March hair. Just the insanity of it all. You know, I, drinking was not an option for me. You know, our literature seems to indicate that we hang on as best we can. And then if we can't hang on any longer, we'll pick up a drink, slow suicide. Or for some of us who recognize that drinking is not an option, then we pick up a gun. Or we run into a bridge abutment or go out a window. Fast suicide. That's it for people like me. Uh, there's no door number three. Either learn how to live by spiritual principles or hang on as best you can to the bitter end, Jack. And our sheriff had shot himself to death in the basement of our courthouse. And my office was on the top floor, and I thought, well, if I shot myself on, in my office, that would add symmetry to the building. It would even things out. Now, I need to say that uh, I was talking, you know, when I talk to people who aren't alcoholics about fighting for those um, seven weeks of continuous sobriety that they were trying to steal away from me, uh, People who aren't alcoholics, they don't laugh. They look at me like I'm crazy. And of course, I am crazy. That's part of the reason why Sandy asked me to share a little bit tonight, because I'm crazy. And he knows I'm crazy. And of course, that calls into question your sanity, because you're sitting here listening with rapt attention. <laughs> but um, I digress. Oh, man, this is an exciting time for me. Next Saturday, uh, December 22nd, uh, 18 years ago. I'm not drinking. I'm not changing. My wife and I are separated yet again. I got a girlfriend. I got a backup girlfriend just in case the girlfriend finds out what I'm really like. I got a girlfriend for special occasions. I think some of you know what that's about. Uh, I'm covered. I got my bases covered. I got an apartment. And uh, two guys, Ken and Bob, had uh, concluded that I was dying of untreated alcoholism. And Bob had come to me. Uh, my dad uh, eventually came to AA. And when he passed away, he had 15 years of continuous sobriety. And Bob said, you know, we got this book in AA, we call it the big book, and uh, I thought maybe you'd be interested in reading it and find out about your dad's illness. A clever guy, that Bob. And uh, if he'd have said anything remotely close to we think you ought to read it so you could find out what's wrong with you, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with me. And I'm definitely not alcoholic because I'm not drinking. And we all know alcoholics have to drink. I may be a little bit on edge, all right? Just a little prickly, but you know what? If you just mind your own damn business, all right? Leave me the heck alone. Just go do something else, all right? Just stop it, would you? 
be fine. Everything's fine here. That, uh, that summer I'd left the psychiatrist's office he, in June and he'd said I was coping very well and that maybe I should just take the summer off and if I wanted to come back in September I could and I left his office wondering whether I should shoot myself that day. <laughs> now I didn't tell him that. I mean, come on. I mean, he's a psychiatrist. If he's any good, he'd know. And I'm not going to give it up, man, you know. You don't, you don't just go pay those guys a couple hundred dollars an hour and then give it to them. They got to work for it. And, uh, so I was coping very well. And, uh, so I'd read that book and, yeah, my dad's in there. And much to my surprise, of course, I was in there and I was willing to concede to, to Bob and contend that there, Ken, that there was a possibility, a, well, a remote possibility slight possibility, if you would, that I may have, I may have contracted a very mild case of alcoholism. Caught it just in time. And uh, that was enough for, uh, for Ken and for Bob. They, they came to my chambers, my judge's office, every Friday after that at lunchtime. And they brought a ba- brown bag lunch and their big books and uh, we would read the big book together, and they would uh, they would explain to me the importance of what we'd read, and uh, I would explain to them as Jack saw it. And as you can imagine, we had many very fine, intellectual, high level conversations there. And I explained to Ken and to Bob that. While I had had some problems in high school, I'll acknowledge that. I was five years in high school. Yeah, Steve, yeah, five years in high school. I, however, also graduated college in four years. And I graduated law school in three years, with honors, I might add. So there, you need to know who you're dealing with. And Ken said, we got degrees on rectal thermometers, Jack, and you know what we do with those. (laughs) I thought that was rude. (laughs) So on the 22nd of December of 89, it was a Friday, and the courthouse was closed, so we couldn't have our big book thing, so we went to lunch, and after lunch, I went back to my apartment, and... There was a Hickory Farms package propped against my door, and the mailman had brought up three flights of steps. I got a cheese log here, I think, maybe, or maybe a sausage, you know. Somebody sent the judge a sausage. That's nice. And uh, I went into my apartment and taking messages off the answering machine and trying to figure out how to open this Hickory Farms box and I had plans for that night. My girlfriend and I, we were going out, and then we had plans for Saturday and then Christmas Eve, and plans for Christmas and plans for New Year's and plans into 1990. And I figured out I'd cut the tape on this box, and I'm listening to the messages, and I lifted the lid of the box. Boom! And uh, I got blown back against the wall. And a federal appellate judge had been killed uh, 10 days before in Birmingham, Alabama, by a package bomb had been sent to his home. And a lawyer in Savannah, Georgia, had been killed five days before by a bomb that had been sent to his office, and I could smell the gunpowder. And I knew that I had opened a bomb, and there was a fire, and I tried to put it out, and I couldn't. And so... Uh, Went out in the hallway and hooked the fire alarm, and my neighbor came, said he had a fire extinguisher. And I went back in to call 911, and when I went to press the button uh, for the 911 call, I realized that part of my right hand had been blown away. And then when I hung the phone up, it felt like somebody was trying to pull my trousers off my hips. And I looked down, and I was standing in a puddle of blood, and it was just getting bigger and bigger as I looked at it. And My neighbor came and asked if uh, there was anything else he could do, and 
asked him to give me a towel, and I opened my trousers, and I didn't have the courage to try to visualize the wound. I just put the towel where I thought I'd been injured and put my back against the wall and slid down on the floor. And uh, the, uh, It was real evident to me. It was clear to me. I was dying. I was alone. And I was scared. And I was powerless. And Ken and Bob had been encouraging me to try to attend meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I wouldn't go in our town, but I would go up to Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, or over to Frederick, Maryland, or down to Martinsburg, West Virginia. And I'd been to enough meetings to to learn the serenity prayer. So the only tool I had to reach for was the serenity prayer, and I asked God to grant me the serenity to accept this thing, which I couldn't change. And the courage to change what I could and the wisdom to know the difference. And I prayed that prayer and I prayed that prayer and I prayed that prayer. And God came. And I experienced a sense of peace and well-being, the likes of which I have never experienced before in my life, nor have I experienced it since. And I knew that if I died on that floor... And never saw my wife or our three children again. It's going to be all right. Didn't know if I was going to live or die or not. But it's going to be all right. And so the police fire and rescue guys came in, and both my eardrums had been blown out, and I couldn't really hear what was being said. And I stopped praying to try to talk to them, and a tremendous wave of fear swept upon me. And so I. Um, I told him, you guys just do whatever you got to do. And I went back to praying the serenity prayer. And as soon as I did, the serenity returned. And they cut all my clothes off of me and everything but my red and green Christmas socks. And they uh, put me on a board and a gurney and took me down three flights of steps and stuffed me in an ambulance with my red and green Christmas socks sticking out the end. And they went around the world on CNN that night, and I went off to the hospital for surgery, and I don't know how shrapnel knows how to stop passing through flesh, but they removed a what was described as a rather substantial piece of shrapnel that was not resting against, but in close proximity to my femoral artery. And uh, obviously, if my femoral artery had been nicked, that would have been that. So they sent me up to a recovery room, and when I came to, Bob was at the foot of my bed, and uh, he uh, he was smiling, and it's really good to have a sponsor. It is really good to have a sponsor, because sponsors just have a different take on stuff. They just see things differently. They really do. And uh, He was smiling. I said, Bob, I notice you're smiling. What are you smiling about? And he said, well, I just think it must be wonderful, Jack, to know that you can't be harmed. I said, Bob, somebody just tried to kill me. Oh, he said, I understand that, Jack. He said, I understand that package you opened contained four pipe bombs. One pipe bomb is more than adequate to kill a human being. Two pipe bombs, that's a little redundant. Three pipe bombs, that's a bit around the bend. Four pipe bombs, Jack, you have made somebody very angry. He said, man has done his very best to kill you. And the only explanation of your survival is the grace of God. He said, God has work for you. I said, oh, really, Bob? What kind of work does God have for me? So I wouldn't presume to know what's God's will in your life, Jack, but he said, I do know that it's God's will for you to be a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that means you're going to have to pray that third step prayer with either me or Ken. You're going to have to do that fourth step inventory, do that fifth step with either Ken or I, make that six step decision, pray that seventh step prayer, make that eight step list. Begin making those nine-step amends so you can live in 10, 11, and 12 and be of maximum service to God and to your fellow man. Good to have a sponsor. 
I wouldn't have come up with that in a million years. You know, I think uh, I left that hospital on Christmas Day, 1989. It was the best Christmas I'd ever had. And I was, uh, the other day I was reminded that when I was drinking, the period from the middle of November to the middle of January, I just drank and drank and drank and drank. Those were the worst 60 days of the year for me. And when I stopped drinking and didn't change during that period of 60 days, every year I fell into the dankest, darkest, deepest depression that I'd ever experienced in my life. And I walked out of that hospital on Christmas Day. 1989, and I'd, it was the best Christmas I'd ever had. And the following Christmas, my wife and I reconciled, and we've been together ever since. And if I don't screw this thing up, come August, we'll be married 42 years. And uh, if she were here, you'd probably want to give her a chip for that. But uh, So I started doing the deal. Now, I don't recommend getting blown up for a learning experience. I really don't. But it will tend to get you to focus on what's important. And my guess is that everybody in this room has had a bomb of one kind or another go off in your life. I think we call it pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I think that's what we call it. I... uh, really enjoyed listening to and seeing Chuck talk about the spiritual principles of this program. I'm, uh, I'm retired as a circuit court judge because of the injuries I received in that bombing. And I've been practicing law uh, for maybe, I guess, 15 years now, solo. I only represent the people that God sends to me. I try to apply the principles of this program to my private practice of law. I represent primarily alcoholics and drug addicts who still have money. So it's a... It's it's kind of a narrow, boutique kind of a practice, but it never ceases to amaze me, the the people God sends to me. I am absolutely satisfied that uh, what Chuck said in that film is absolutely correct. The practice of law became really, really easy for me when I applied the principles of this program to my daily life. I've had opportunities in Alcoholics Anonymous since I became a member of Alcoholics Anonymous to do amazing, wonderful, incredible things. And uh, both in and out of the program. And... uh, You know, how do you fit AA into your life, Jack? You're busy. How do you fit it in? I don't fit it in. AA is my life. It's because of AA that I get to do the other things that I get to do in and out of AA. We were talking at lunch today about a guy. 20 years ago, I sentenced him to three years in prison. And uh, but I didn't let them take him out of the courthouse. I just they held him in the holding area for five or six hours, and we brought him back into court. And he had three DWIs, and you know I suspended most of the sentence. And he said his last drink had been on Columbus Day, and I said, "Well, on Columbus Day, Columbus discovered a new world. Maybe you'll discover a new way of life." And I sentenced him to three AA meetings a week for five years as part of his probation. And he did that. Then when he got off of probation, he started doing five AA meetings a week, just to show me. (laughs) And uh, three years ago, I was told I had to have open heart surgery. And the day before I was to go for open heart surgery, John called me. And I've never spoken to John on the telephone in my life. So what do you want, John? He says, well, you know, Nancy and I are engaged. I said, yeah, I'd heard that. He said, we're going to get married on July the 5th. That's wonderful. He said, we've been praying about who I should ask to be my best man. He's got three adult boys. His dad was living with them. 
He said, we've decided to ask the person who has had the most profound impact on my life. I said, well, who's that, John? He said, it's you, Jack. Will you be my best man? When I sentenced that guy to three years in prison, he wasn't thinking about me being his best man. (laughs) And neither was I. You know, people ask me how I'm doing today. I tell them I'm happy, joyous, and free today. But I think it's going to get better. And I say that because that's my experience. And if you're here tonight and you're not happy, joyous, and free, you need to talk to your sponsor. Because there's something you're not doing that you ought to be doing. Or there's something you're doing that you shouldn't be doing. Because as Chuck said and Sandy underscored, there is a conscious separation from God in this program if you're not happy, joyous, and free. Our book says, and my experience confirms, that happy, joyous, and free is promised to each and every one of us. I'm here in Alcoholics Anonymous because somebody prayed. I know my wife prayed. I know my kids prayed. A lot of somebody's prayed. And you're here in Alcoholics Anonymous because somebody prayed. And you may not like that and you may not believe that. And AA doesn't care. It's truth. We're here as a result of prayer. I look at this room full of people and think about the journeys that all of our lives had to take to bring us here to this point in time. You know, there's some people here who weren't planning on coming. I know that. And there's some people who have been sent here to hear something, and I don't know what it was they were sent here to hear. Maybe it was something earlier today. Maybe it was something around the fire ring. Maybe it's what's going to be said tomorrow. I don't know. But I know that many of us have been sent here to hear something. And our book says, There is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. Right here, right now. There's a book that's already been mentioned that Eckhart Tolle wrote called The Power of Now. It's our program rewritten for those of us that don't understand the big book or don't care to read it. There's a guy named Joel Osteen down in Texas. They tell me he has the largest church in America. He wrote a book, bestseller, New York Times, your best life now. In our book it says that our purpose for living is to be of maximum service to God and to our fellow man. There's a guy named Rick Warren who wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Life. We don't have to buy those books. We're welcome to read them after we have a firm foundation in Alcoholics Anonymous. There's nothing wrong with those books. But if we're firmly rooted in Alcoholics Anonymous, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, you will recognize our program in those books. If you are not firmly rooted in Alcoholics Anonymous, there are things in those books that may work very well for other people. Don't work for alcoholics. I started my day this morning with prayer and meditation. Because the big book tells me so. I'm not good at it. Most days I don't like it, at least when I start. But our book says, and my experience confirms, I can take my mind to a different thought plane. I didn't know that was possible, but my experience confirms it. I used to think if I got up on the wrong side of the bed, it was going to be one of those days. Now I know all I have to do is sit quietly, pray the prayers, reflect upon them, Do what the book says. So now I have choices in my life. I can do what I want to do and suffer the consequences of that. I have warehouses full of evidence that that doesn't work. And I have an ego that says, today may be the day. And then I've got a book that says, come along with us, Jack. Follow our directions and live happy, joyous, and free. 
Let's see. Egocentric misery, happy, joyous, and free. What's my choice going to be? And we debate that for a while. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, it would be nice to run your life today, Jack. Well, yeah, Jack, but you know it's going to crash and burn. <sighs> Alcoholics are the only people that I know that treat loneliness with isolation. <laughs> I cut myself off from the very thing that's helping me. Man, was that meeting great? Was that a great meeting we went to? Oh, yeah, it was terrific. You going to be back here next week? No, I'm too busy. I'll cut myself off from the very thing that's saving my life. My ego will do that. So, you know, what an honor to be here with you, you gentlemen and one lady. What a privilege to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. What a blessing to be able to live happy, joyous, and three, free. Thank you for letting me share. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the uh, last session of our Far Corners weekend. Uh, before I get started, I want to tell you how grateful I am that you all came. The questions were just amazing. That, that's worth its weight in gold just to see the thinking that went into them. I've talked to Scott later, and he was worn out, and so was I. That was not a easy, easy things to think about. Um, I also can't tell you how grateful I am for the guys that, that, and gal, Amy, that are on our board that do so much work. Um, they really love this. They're so excited about the fact you're coming as our guests. And they can hardly wait and hope that they just go, oh, I hope it's perfect for them. So there's no, um, you don't have to push anybody, come on, we've got to get this done. They're all ahead of me in figuring out how to make this as much fun as possible. And it shows. You can just feel that things have been thought about ahead of time, and um, so you can understand why I just love all of them. And it, it's, we have board meetings every so often over at my house, and they just are fun. We hate to see them end. We get pizza delivered in, and we sit and we talk and figure out what would be fun for next year. So I think that's the way everything in life should be done. Fun. Let's get together and have fun. I don't know why. I mean, just watching Chuck. Think about it. He was having fun giving a spiritual lecture to freshmen in college. That's not a fun thing. I'd love to send one of you in there. <laughs> I think if we did the close-up, we'd see a lot of sweat coming down your brow as no one was listening to you. <laughs> Oh, so let's see if we look back over um, what we've been trying to capture here. I think we started out with the two bookends, step one and step 12, total surrender and awakening, and saw how essential they were. It's a cyclical thing. You can't have one without the other. They, ha they go together. They're just, it's total failure is the predecessor of awakening. Because the ego doesn't give up unless there's an emergency. Total surrender is not an intellectual exercise. It's an event. And it's an event that we can be very grateful for. That for some unknown reason, we were chosen to be smashed down further than we may have otherwise gone, which caused the opening of our mind towards surrender, which seemed like the end of everything. The end. 
So the end has to become has to come before the beginning can start. And we're just seeing this whole cyclical thing that is the way the universe is. Birth and death, surrender, awakening, up and down, in and out. It's amazing. So we saw that. And then we went back and take a look at our big book at phrases that we've seen for many years, and maybe they look different now. Maybe the ab- way back in the beginning of the big book, the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered our hearts and lives in a way that is indeed miraculous. At one time, for all of us, that was very interesting. I wonder what it is. The absolute certainty that our Creator has entered our hearts and lives in a way that is indeed miraculous. Now we look at it and go, yeah, there is that absolute certainty that my Creator is inside of me and lives in there in a way that is indeed miraculous. We've had a glimpse of the ultimate kingdom. We're walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Those were all words at one time, and they slowly became a reality. I can feel walking hand in hand. And when we drew near, he disclosed himself to us. So that happens from seeking. We see the importance of seeking. Seek, 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 and all of a sudden, you did a good job. Here I am. And he reveals himself to us. And it's a very personal experience. And it's worth continuing until it happens. I watched Mike with the holograms. And at one point he told me, I guess I'm going to have to go back to Alaska without seeing it. And and he kept trying and trying because he didn't want to go back to Alaska. And all of a sudden... Bingo! And then he went around and saw three others. And he was very excited and happy, as he well should be. It was revealed to him, not as fast as somebody else. But when it was, we knew it was real, even though it wasn't there before. It suddenly was there for me. And the guy next to me, it's still not there. But I'm praying that he sees it too. Because there's no competition. That's there for everybody. Just if two people see it, it doesn't mean it goes away and nobody else can see it. So it's, it's not a competitive thing. I got mine. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> infinite supply. Infinite father, infinite children, infinite journey. Just on and on. And so... We tried to tell a story of the journey from the material to the spiritual. And we all say those words, but perhaps we don't have a picture of them that you may have now. When the tenth step says we've entered the world of the spirit, and in our early sobriety, if someone said, well, what is the world of the spirit? Our real answer would be, I don't know. Even though we're saying it, I don't know. I guess it's this ethereal place where spirits hang out. And they're just up there going, hi, 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 hi. Nice here in the world of the spirit. Great. I love it in here. It's a great spot. It's a great spot. But we're not quite sure what it might look like. What would the world of the spirit look like? So then we come here and we see that we are going to make this journey from the material to the spiritual. So in order to understand that, we have to go, what is the material? What is the material world versus the spiritual world? And if we go back to the um, analogy of the traffic accident, so 20 eyewitnesses, and we realize there's 20 views of the accident we come to the conclusion there's no such thing as the material world. 
If there's 8 billion people on the planet, there's 8 billion material worlds. There is no the material world. So that means that each material world was constructed by the individual, by thinking, by taking the world that God created and commenting on it. That's what we do. We comment on the world. There shouldn't be fill-in-the-blanks. War. There shouldn't be glaciers. There shouldn't be poverty. There shouldn't. It shouldn't be so hot. It should. It should be fair. It should be. It should be. And pretty soon, the commentary that we made on the original world becomes the world. It starts out much like a spider getting ready to make a web with one strand. Doesn't look like much, does it? Hey, pal, what's that supposed to do? Oh, I'm not through yet. I'm going to make another strand over here, and then I'm going to make another strand. Now, for us, the analogy is one comment, one judgment, one resentment about the original world. And slowly, since each thought creates a thread, we go one, two, three. Just think how many millions of thoughts, comments, judgments we've made about the world that God created. Pretty soon, if we're a spider, you can't see light through the web. You can't see any light whatsoever. We just keep going. Only we make a three-dimensional web so that no matter which way we turn, we see what we put together with our thoughts. And you might make the analogy to an egg. We created our own egg that we're inside of. So everywhere we look to see what's going on and report on the material world, it's all going on in our egg. Oh, look at that. Look at that. That's all. Awesome. That? Look at that. And uh, so I asked you next to me, I said, don't you think this is a mess? Now, he put together a different egg. He goes, no, it looks good to me. Well, how could you think it looks good and I think it looks bad? He's not looking at the same thing I am. And that's where we are. And as far as we're concerned, that's the real world. That's the material world that we created. Each one of us lives in a different material world, so when it says we're going to make the journey from the material world to the spiritual world, it's from your material world, my material world, Scott's material world, and we're going to now try to go to the spiritual world, the world of the spirit. I wonder where that is. Maybe we've got to poke a hole in the egg, like an awakening. Poke, poke. But the egg doesn't like to be poked. That's the ego. And it knows if we poke and get out there far enough, we're going to want to throw this away. We're going to want to destroy it, crush it. The idea that somehow we can drink like normal people has to be smashed, crushed. So the journey from... The material world to the spiritual world is a journey out of the egg that we made back into the world that God created. It's right here. We don't go anywhere. We just return from the story that we made back to what was here before we started making up a story. And that's my picture of the journey from the material world to the spiritual world. So when it says we've entered the world of the spirit, picture, I poked my head through this freaking mess I made, took a look around and went, yo! I've, I listen to various spiritual teachers and stuff, and when they, um, three of them made the same comment, 
that as the full awakening just came over them, guess what they said? They said, I can't believe I forgot this. (laughs) I can't believe I forgot this, which is God's world. I just forgot it. So you can see, we're not, we're not going to learn anything. We're just going to return to what we already knew before we improved <laughs> on God's world. You see what I'm saying? We, we, we just looked around, saw a bunch of stuff that needed fixing, and we started fixing it with thoughts. Think about it, think about it, think about it, think about it. And uh, this whole journey involves not thinking Letting go, letting go of weaving. Stop making those threads. Stop being like a spider and go, wait a minute, I can close this up tighter. Now you can't even get a glimpse outside of this thing that I created. So how often do we say he lives in his own little world? Everybody does. Now, you may say, well, why are we so stupid to do that? And I'll get to that in a in a different story, but there's a reason behind it. In, in, I think it makes a lot of sense. It's a prodigal son thing. It, it, it's, it, it's all part of cyclical nature of things. We go out, we come back. And, and it makes everything make sense. And um, so anyway, that's what I think that journey um, from the material world to the spiritual world looks like to me. That's what it looks like today. Now, maybe 10 years from now, I'll go, don't use that story. Here's a better one. I don't know. I mean, maybe I'll hear one from Scott, and I'll go, I'm stealing that, Scott, and I'm not even going to give you credit. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. And I think I touched on this earlier, which was... Um, the movie they made about the greatest story ever told. And we got to realize that that was a movie about a story, the greatest story. It could be about any spiritual journey, the greatest story ever told. And the point I wanted to make about that story was it didn't look so great halfway through. It looked like the story of the world's biggest loser, a dropout couldn't even get a job still living with his mother I mean the whole thing if you looked at that said this is going nowhere and then people are following him are you guys crazy you follow what I'm saying and then all of a sudden reborn and we took a look at everything and we said oh my god I didn't think that was oh my god so The point of that story is to say that all great stories look like they're going nowhere in order for the turnaround to take place that makes it great. It wouldn't be great if you just stayed up here. What's so great? I've been happy all my life, and I'm still happy. (laughs) Let's make a Hollywood movie out of that. We got to get him down in jail and then back. We can't have him just stay happy. There's no story there. There's no lesson. There's no. That is the way life works. Cyclical, happy, unhappy. You follow what I'm saying? And, and so I would submit to you all that the greatest story you'll ever see is your own. Your job is to just watch it like it was a movie. Holy cow. Look where they got the hero now. In a straitjacket. I wonder how God gets me out of this. Do you see what I'm saying? You're you're just the actor. The story is taking place through you. You think you're the author. I was going to, I used this story last night. I introduced our speakers as dancers from the Argentine. And the reason I did it was so that today we could say that what you saw last night, you saw the dance, not the dancers. 
The dance was coming through them from somewhere else. You saw God Jack Cordoning, and you saw God Steve Abraming. That's what you saw. That's what we are. We're God's story being told through us. And it's going to be told the way he wants it. It's going to follow the journey that he wants. So what, what role do I play? Well, the role we used to play was to comment on it. This is a, this is a sick story. I'm involved in a tragedy. I mean, this is us. So we have a separate story going on. It's like talking in the theater, commenting on the plot so that everyone around us can hear us. What a lousy movie. I wonder who directed this. I never did like her. This, this is a shame she's in this movie. And you never see the movie. And we do that with our own life. And like it's going to change anything. And so when we unweave our story and just come back to be an observer, which is what being is, there's nothing to do but be. <clears throat> There's nothing to know. There's nothing to learn. You don't have to learn much to watch a movie. You just watch. You don't have to teach anybody. Okay, now look at the screen. I think that comes naturally. Not many people walk in the movie and face away from the screen until they're trained to look at the screen. So that's what I'm trying to establish about our journey. And um, I mentioned earlier the cyclical thing. I just want to talk about that some more because it's so essential to see. Um, a lot of meditation will have us focus on our breath because breath is sort of the essence of life. Breath is the essence of life. I mean, that's the, one way of looking at it. And so if we looked at a breath, we could, for story purposes, say that the breathing in is the birth of a breath. And breathing out is the death of a breath. Very short lifespan. You know what I mean? And so if I'm inside and here comes a breath in, I would go, hey, how you doing? Good to have you in here. Oh, you got to go? Yeah, I got to go. Okay, goodbye. Mm. <sighs> hey, hi, come on in. Glad to see you. Oh, you got to go? <sighs> in and out. The birth of a breath and then the death of a breath. Now, the funny thing is, if you play mind games with that like I do, I think I'll watch these breaths live and die. Hi, welcome, goodbye, welcome, hi, hi. And then I really get into it, the death, is much more pleasant than the birth. As a matter of fact, I wish I could keep exhaling forever. It doesn't take any effort, you know what I mean? I wish I could keep pushing my lungs so that it would just keep going. Because the more I push it in that direction, the more I know there's something wonderful there, and I wish I could keep breathing out forever which tells me something very attractive about death. The, beyond that, breathing in and out is something even bigger. And there's that cyclical. I wonder how many times the moon has gone around planet Earth in four billion years. That's a lot of times around. Look at that, a full moon. Full moon, full moon, full moon, full moon. God damn, that's been going on a long time. Maybe that just goes on, probably looks like it's going to go on forever. You see what I mean? Around and around, just like clockwork. Mm -hmm. Tides go in, tides go out. You can see it everywhere. Crops get planted. Now they grow. Now they're harvested. Now they grow. Now they're harvested. So if we're happy, that's, that's wonderful. Enjoy it. Now, now comes the sad part of the movie. Oh, good. Here's the sad part. We know the sad part's going to end, so let's just enjoy the sad part. Okay, here comes the happy part. 
Okay, here comes the sick part. Oh, sick, sick, sick. Okay, here's the sick part. Okay, here comes the return to health part. Oh, boy, here comes this. Here comes that. We don't have to react to anything. You know what I mean? We don't have to go, oh, my God, I've 50 years of this. That's what we react to, a cycle that's going on. We go, here's the cycle, and we go, oh, it's going to stay in a straight line now for 50 years. It's not going to continue the cycle. It's been going on forever. So along those lines, I'm going to tell you a story. And it's actually a combination of two stories that you already know. And I called the story the prodigal Adam. We already know the two stories. In this story, Adam's the only person involved in the story of Eden. And Adam likes it there. He says, this is cool here. Everything is provided for him. He is in absolute contact with his creator. Everything is beautiful. There's no pain involved. It's, it's just wonderful. He's been there for eons. Just simply enjoying everything that's there. And other spirits that are there talk with great gratitude the way we've been talking about this weekend. Isn't it wonderful? Aren't we fun to be together? We're doing, oh, yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> and a snake came up to him one day and said, how you doing, Adam? He said, good. Nice here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I love it here. Some of the other people were complaining that you can't eat apples here. I think they're way out of line myself. I think it's fine that you can't eat the apple. I think it's, why is that important? Right, Adam? It's silly to be focused on apples when there's everything other than the apple. There's heaven here. And he slithers away. And Adam says, you know, he's got a point. He makes a point. He makes a damn good point. The more I think about this, it's a freaking outrage you can't eat an apple. (laughs) What sort of an insult is that? Why would a loving God torture someone? With that, why would he? What kind of a place is this where you can't eat apples? Jesus, this is awful. Now I look out at the view and I go, there's a view with no apples. There's this relationship with my higher power being ruined by his meanness in not letting me have an apple. You know what? I've had it. I'm taking an apple, and I'm getting out of here. And he takes the apple. (laughs) Takes a big bite. Go, "Mm, man, these are good. And says to all the other spirits, you ought to try this, man. (laughs) I'm going to go make a much better world than this. I can do a much better job. Everybody's going to have apples. Apple a day keeps the doctor away. Apples, apples, apples. You're the apple of my eye. Apple pie. Love apple pie. Got to have apple pie. Do you like apple pie a la mode? I love apple pie a la mode. Isn't it great to be in a world where apples are everywhere and you can have all the apples you want? Yes, sir. I'm doing a much better job than that place. This is Eden Plus. That's what we're going to have down here. I'm going to create Eden, Eden Plus. And he starts out to create his version of the jackpot. And he's got a plan, a blueprint. Go to college, study this. Oh, boy, look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Apples all the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a plan. He's lying in a straitjacket one day. And on the bedside table is a bowl of apples. <laughs> Which, unfortunately, he can't reach. <laughs> he says, well, maybe this world's unfair, too. And he reconsiders. 
And he goes, I guess I can't. I don't think I can make anything. Ugh. I wonder if I could possibly swallow my pride and go back and see if they'll take me in again. This is a major problem. But the desperate nature finally gets them, hat in hand, head bowed, beaten, dragging his sorry butt back to the gate. Ding, ding, ding. Who is it? It's Adam. What do you want? Can I come back? Boom! Yeah! Come on in! And they take him back. And they celebrate it. And he looks around, and it's ten times better than he remembered. He's ten times happier than he ever was before he left. He is so grateful they took him back. And he starts talking to people. He says, it's just amazing how much happier I am. And they tell him, yeah, that was the point of the whole trip. That's why there's 9,000 people over there in line waiting to go to earth. So they can be 10 times happier than they were. That wasn't a wasted journey, Adam. That was part of the plan. That was part of the plan. It's the only way to make it even better. So he's talking with some of his buddies, and he said, have you been? Yeah. That's how it works. It's really amazing. By the way, while you were gone, they switched from apples to bananas. Really? (laughs) Why'd they do that? Well, the apple lobby (laughs) said, you've banned us for about a billion years. How about picking on somebody? Oh, he says, God, those lobbies. And he starts laughing. And he goes back. To all his familiar haunts, and indeed every one, is ten times better. The place where you can see black holes is just more brilliant. There's a part of the universe where it's all indigo, his favorite color. And he can just watch planets made out of indigo, stars made out of indigo, just the color indigo doing dances. His... Happiness is beyond measure. And he enjoys this for 10 or 15,000 years. And he says to himself, it just doesn't get any better than this. It just doesn't get any better than this. And then he says, Bananas? Why did they switch to bananas? I can't eat apples anymore with my dentures, but bananas are perfect. Do you suppose they saw me coming back and said, let's switch to bananas to get him. The more I think about bananas, what do we think is happening? I think it's going to get ten times better. That's what's going to happen. It's going to get ten times better. That's my version of the cyclical nature of God's plan for us. You think it's good? Watch this. You think that's the best you can have? Watch this. Eternal father, eternal children, eternal journey. And I suppose even there we've got to get used to the cyclical nature of things. At this point, I am reminded of the last um, page in the 12 and 12, 
when Bill says, these little studies come to a close. Does that, anybody remember that? It's right near the last thing. He's been going on that 12th step for about 20 pages. <laughs> and he finally says, these little studies now come to a close. And uh, we read the 12 and 12 at one of our studies. We have a big book study, 12 and 12 study. And whenever we get to that page, I go, oh, oh, oh. And then I go, yeah, but what happens when this comes to a close? We go back to step one, and we start all over again. And I go, yay. So I go, ooh. So this weekend is coming to a close. And a lot of things have happened. I think God's world has, just because of the setting, has been revealed to us And we're saying it can't get any better than this. This is it. But we know it's going to get better. But how does it get better? By getting worse and then better. In other words, this is it. The high can't stay. And so we're going to go to a different level. And then we'll seek even harder and it'll go to a higher level. And that's how we'll continue. And pretty soon we'll ignore the down cycle. We'll just accept it. Oh, yeah. In order to have the pleasure of breathing out, I have to (gasps) breathe in and then experience another cycle. And I don't want to see it end, but I know it's going to begin again. So the one thing that... um, I think we've left out now that we've gotten a glimpse and the great reality is becoming more real and we're aware that our creator is inside of us. What do you suppose would be the best way to communicate to our own creator? To communicate. What would be a good way to communicate? Well, who do we suppose our creator is? This is a hard thing to define. How could you define? We had a question, who am I? Well, who is God? How about that question? You think that could be answered? Yep. It's easy. That's the easiest question of the day. God and the universe are an absolute, and complete mystery. That's the end of the story. The universe and God, which is everything, are an absolute and complete mystery. Now allow that to sink in. The problem with us, with the human ego is, Ah, mystery, I'll figure it out. Now, wait a minute. It's an absolute and complete mystery. Yeah, I know, but I'll figure it out. No, it's an absolute and complete mystery. Oh, can't be figured out. Right, it can't. Well, what am I supposed to do about it? What am I supposed to do about it? How about appreciate it? How about enjoy it? How about look at it? How about express some reaction to this mystery? If God were a composer and he composed the greatest symphony that anybody could listen to. And he assembled us all in the cosmic opera house for this symphony. And he wanted to know what we thought about his music. 
One thing he could do is wait for the show to get over and see if we stood up and applauded. But everybody stands up now at the end of the show. And they go, it's not a good way. It's not a good way of allowing the audience to communicate to you. A better way would be to get behind the stage, up above the curtain, with little binoculars, so you can zero in on individual faces and watch their face as different parts of the music is played and see if there aren't tears and then smiles and then awe, just You can't communicate any better than that. That sends the ultimate message. Absolute awe. So here's this great mystery that's been prepared for us. (laughs) How do we communicate back? I would suggest awe. I would suggest, wow, what's that? I do that every time these um, cosmic people discover something else. I just go, oh, my God. And I'm sure God goes, you're right on, right on. Wow. That's it. Wow. I think that has to make the creator pretty happy. I got three wows out of him today. Three wows. I'd say that's one of the best ways of communicating there is. I would say, if it's a wonderful universe, we should be full of wonder. That's it. Just And so to capture that, I'm going to let you listen to something. And I think this is the best way to communicate with God that there is. If we do this for the rest of our lives, you're going to make God very, very happy.